Casual Thurs, that's what we call it. And Friday, Casual Shabbat, the Majority Report with Sam Cedar. It is Friday, January 11th, 2019. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five time award winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live. Steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America, downtown Brooklyn, USA. On the program today, the proprietor and host of the Benjamin Dixon Show, Ben Dixon. Also on the program today, the proprietor of the Langdon Boom eBay page, Matthew Film Guy, will be joining us. Meanwhile, Trump's looking to take billions away from disaster area relief to deal with the crisis at the border and build the wall. And the shutdown is getting more severe. Zero dollar checks being sent to furloughed workers, airport terminals closing. Mitch McConnell actively blocking a vote to end the shutdown. Maybe someone will notice that he is the linchpin to all of this. Somebody just found out that Steve King is a racist. And progressive score a B on their plan to get key committee spots. Michael Cohen to testify to the Democratic-led House uh, Committee. And uh, congratulations, oceans have been heating up faster than the scientists realized. All this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Um, yes, it is uh, Friday. Um, not the uh, craziest of 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 news weeks in the Trump era, that's for sure. Uh, but of course, um, that is because the the government has shut down, and uh, Donald Trump seems to have uh, shut down. Of course, uh, Mike Pompeo was um, was in uh, Cairo. Uh, was it yesterday or two days ago? Uh, de- having delivered what some people call the single worst foreign policy speech by a senior representative of the U.S. government in the history of the U.S. government, which is, um, it's always important to be a superlative. And so uh, if that's the way you have to get it, it's unfortunate. But, I mean, as long as you get there, it's nice to be the most of something. Um we will uh, talk a little bit about that. Also, um, I don't know. Maybe we'll talk about this with um, uh, with with Ben. The the sort of I, I mean it, the almost it it, w- it was so inevitable that we would see the Politico piece talking about how people are frustrated with um, with AOC I- in the Congress. Um, I would anticipate more of these, and um, it's. I think it's a good sign. Um, Matt Stoller, too, if you have the opportunity um, to check out his uh, his Twitter feed, uh, has a a great um, a great uh, thread on it, and it's not even ideological. Uh, in some respects, it is um, it is I, I, I contend a lot of it is just the the Democratic Party, much of its leadership has ossified. And is that am I saying that right? Mm-hmm. It just sounds like a weird word as it comes out of my mouth it has ossified um, and uh, it. You know, there the 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 analog I would give, or maybe we should just wait for Ben. But the analog uh, that I would give would be the reporting that we saw from, uh, on one hand, the Intercept, but also uh, I think it was uh, uh, Putnam and um, Scopel 
uh, Thetoscopal. Scope uh, skull. And um, about what was happening in these uh, districts where Democrats were organizing. And regardless of ideology, the, uh, the DCCC was coming in and sort of bigfooting in ways that were not strategic or tactical, just stupid. And this is what you get when you have sort of um, legacy and um, very static organizations in some way. And, um, I, I, you know, I think ideology is one thing. I don't, but I think what they're really more concerned about with AOC is that she is not following the sort of very, um, you know, the, the niceties and the rules. And she is sort of going around um, the institutional, soft institutional um, apparatus. And I think that's what we're seeing more than anyone's, you know, broad concerns that she's going to pull the party too far to the left. It's uh, both. Well, it, it, it might be. Uh, but um, I think it's it's coming from people who I think have similar politics in some respect. No. At least no. Well, did you read the piece? Nope. OK. Um, anyways, um, best to to read the piece that I'm referencing before you characterize it, I think. But um, I'm kind of speaking in the general sense. Right. But I'm speaking specifically about this piece and these criticisms. And so um, I think there's no doubt there are members of the Democratic Party who are, uh, you know, don't want the party to move to the left and are concerned about her um, her celebrity, you know, defining them in a more conservative district or whatnot. But um, the issue here is is really more about a um, sclerotic institution that does not like this type of energy. Um, and uh, so there's going to be more of this. Uh, but um, I don't know that there's much that they can do about it, except for, obviously, in some respects, um, make it hard for her to to achieve certain things in the House. But I have a feeling her agenda in terms of achievement is, is slightly different. So uh, we shall see. Uh, but meanwhile, the attacks from the right on AOC are pretty much garden variety. Um, this is where they pretend that they're ideological when they're really, it's about business. And by that, I mean, here is a guy, uh, Justin Haskins, from the Heartland Institute, on with Steve Ducey on Fox and Friends. Now, if you don't remember uh, the Heartland Institute, um, they came up because there was uh, a treasure trove of documents that uh, were leaked uh, in 2012 that uh, spoke to their strategy to fight any response to climate change. This was an organization that received at least uh, almost three quarters of a million dollars from Exxon uh, before they started to... Um, uh, uh, before in the late 90s, they stopped disclosing their donors. Um, and they also, oddly enough, were also involved in helping um, uh, smoking. Uh, so I should say tobacco. At one point, um, the former Heartland president uh, wrote in an op-ed that moderate smoking does not raise uh, lung cancer risks. And there were few, if any, adverse health effects uh, associated with smoking. Just got to be moderate. Just got to be moderate. Stop politicizing the science. Stop politicizing it. I, I got news for you. Think as, clearly. As, as someone who was um, an adult in 1998, it was quite clear that uh, cigarette smoking was dangerous. This is not, we're not talking like uh, the late 18th century. Got to get 19th all the facts. Century. Yeah, exactly. Um, if you smoke a cigarette before the full moon outside of the distance of a woman on her period, it's actually good for your blood pressure. Science. 
from the heartland. Anyways, this thing, this uh, Heartland Institute is literally a who's who of a uh, right wing um, uh, billionaires and, and millionaires, and also just like the oil and gas industry, the um, the leadership packs. I mean, it's uh, goes on and on and on. Uh, so, uh, but here is uh, Justin. Is that his name? Justin Haskins on the Green New Deal. Good morning. It's great to be with you. It's great to have you. You know, when you hear Green New Deal, you think, okay, this is just about uh, the environment, right? But when you look at some of the main points, and then Pause we'll it. ask you to... You know, to one, of the, one of the giveaways as to why it's not just about the environment would be the New Deal part. In fact, <laughs> in fact, that's not... I don't... I, don't, I mean... That's sort of what, it's sort of baked in the cake, I think you would say. Yeah, Green New Deal. In fact, uh, of those three words, two of them uh, would imply that it has more to do with the New Deal uh, than uh, environment. Uh, just, but let's not get picky. When you look at some of the main points, and then we'll ask you to, to comment on it, it does call for the elimination of the use of fossil fuels within a dozen years. It calls for universal health care. It calls for federal jobs guarantees. And it calls for a basic income program across the country. That is not just about the environment. That's pretty much about everything. Yeah, that's right. Uh, this is actually not about green energy. It would be impossible to, uh, to switch the entire electricity generation system in the United States uh, over to renewable energy in just 12 years. And I think Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders and people like that know that. This is really about socialism. This is nothing more than a socialist Trojan horse. That's why they've inserted all sorts of programs into the Green New Deal that have nothing to do with green energy. Right, exactly. You know, and when you look at those things, and it, I've been- Pause it again. Uh, the package is not called the Green Energy Program. It's called the Green New Deal. New Deal. Things like Social Security uh, came out of the New Deal. And it, I've been to Bernie Sanders uh, rallies where, you know, the audience there, they, they love to hear what he's saying because he said, look, you have been uh, kept down by Washington. I'm going to open up possibilities that have never been possible before. The problem is when you realistically look at the price, it's like, uh, wow, can we afford that? <laughs> Yeah, well, we absolutely cannot afford it. I mean, we're talking about tens of trillions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Ju just the single payer health care part of this alone, the Mercatus Center estimates would cost $32 trillion in the first 10 years. And even if we were to double all taxes, including individual and corporate rates, right. we would not be able to pay for just that one part of it. Pause it. So uh, one of the things I really enjoy about that talking point right there is that uh, a, as you recall, uh, the Mercatus uh, Foundation uh, did say that the cost of uh, of, of single payer health care would be thirty two trillion dollars. They also said in the same report that the cost of not doing single payer health care and just continuing on with the what we have now will cost uh, thirty five to thirty six trillion dollars. And on top of that, it also that talking point has the added bonus of saying, we could tax everybody five times over and not raise that. Well, the point is the v vast majority of that money is already being raised insofar as we're taxing people at this rate. That's how or, or it's being paid out. That money's going to get spent in some fashion. And based upon what the uh, U.S. government pays now for health care, you don't need to raise a new $32 trillion out of, uh, out of the massive expense that we spend on health care, you need to raise probably uh, less than half of that. But, you know, he's not going to explain that part. I always want to know who we means when they talk about how we can't afford it, right? Because he's clearly not talking about an aging senior who can't afford their diabetes medication or struggling single mom right who uh, already can't afford health care i think what they're, they're what they're thinking is taxpayers taxpayers can't that's afford a it. dog whistle yeah, exactly. yes oh indeed well and corporate rates right we would not be able to pay for just that one part of it why do you think uh justin so many of these prominent democrats are moving so far to the left is it because bernie sanders had such a good run last time 
Yeah, I, mean, I think that that's a big part of it. I certainly think it helps. But I think that the party is moving to the left. I don't think this is just a political posturing. I actually think that the Democratic Party is becoming the Socialist Party of America, that it's slowly occurring, and that if we don't do something to stop these individuals, we're going to wake up in 20 years, and we're going to find ourselves in a, a radically different America, an America that looks more like the Soviet Union and less like the United States. That's yeah, right, yeah. starting with... Uh, <laughs> Throwing, oh, yeah. throwing you in a quarry somewhere, dude. There you Good go. Luck. Like, yeah. I'm not going to be able to wear those. Top uh, some maple. Yeah, well, I mean. I mean, the, uh, resting everybody with glasses is, would be pretty close, but I would need to get laser. I'm not. Yeah, don't before. worry. We'll give you a little bit of time. Uh, I'm not so. I'm not opposed to that. I mean, they're not trying to create socialism. I believe Bernie and AOC are sincere social democrats, but certainly some socialist organizations, I'm not going to say who, uh, support them as part of a, you know, a wider, more long-term project to transition to socialism. Oh, look at that. Uh, where did we get that uh, list of donors to the, to the Heartland? One is the... Uh, this a lot of, a lot of um, well, One is the payers. Donors Capital Fund. I don't know where that's from, that's but... The main Sounds august. Oh, okay. That's the one. That's like the um, the the super friends of all the right wing uh, slash funds. That's where but the Koch brothers did their first trading places bet. Through. That, exactly. <laughs> and the uh, Mercer Family Foundation has given almost six million dollars. Uh, Dunn's Foundation for the Advancement of Right Thinking, one point three uh, million dollars. The Lyndon Harry Bradley Foundation, one point two. The um, Oh, there's a, an Exxon comes in with like uh, 530 taxpayers. Dollars. Yeah, there you go. So <laughs> lots of taxpayers. All right. As we were saying, folks, <laughs> just a reminder, you can support this program by going to join the majority report dot com. When you do, you not only support the free show, you get the full show without commercials and you get extra content every single day. That is during the week. 99.7% of the time. I just made up that number. Uh, there's been a day or two, I think. We are now on uh, episode something like 2002 or something like that. I think so it's 2004. 2004. Uh, so check it out. Also, um, well, we're going to see a bunch of people at uh, the live show this weekend. And we, we had a, a listener who uh, sent in, said that... Um, who sent us two tickets. Um, this is listener Morgan. I have two tickets for the event at Bell House this Sunday. I sadly will not be able to use. It's a shame for them to go to waste. I'm hoping you guys can find someone to take them. So uh, send us a, an email that says two free tickets in the subject line at majorityreporters at gmail.com. Two free tickets, and uh, we'll hook you up. All right, quick break, then Ben Dixon. We are back, Sam Cedar, on the Majority Report, on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome to uh, back to the program the proprietor of the Benjamin Dixon Show uh, and the um, co-founder of Rebuilding the North Star, or I guess that's the uh, website, right? But it's the, uh, 
the yeah. rebuilt North Star, uh, Ben Dixon. Ben, welcome to the show. Sam, thanks so much for having me, man. It's always a pleasure. When is uh, the um, – when do you – what's the plan to launch uh, yeah. the no- North Star? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, actually, Sam, we just acquired the Northstar.com. Oh. It, it, took a, it took a lot of doing, a lot of uh, negotiations and um, some money <laughs> to get it. But we got the Northstar.com. Uh, so everyone can go there and we are launching February 14th, which is uh, coincides with the culmination of the bicentennial celebration of Frederick Douglass's birth. So that is our official launch date, February 14th. We're going to have some articles out from some of the top thinkers of our time. They've agreed to come on and, and do some pieces for us. And our first video show will be out that day as well as some podcasts. So all roads lead to February 14th. Wow. That's great. Congratulations. I'm very excited. Thank about you, man. Um, Thank you. All right. So let's uh, just start with where we are on on the on the shutdown. The the latest is that Donald Trump um, and it's unclear where this is coming from. It's it's three U.S. officials familiar with the briefing uh, that uh, Donald Trump would use the Army Corps of Engineers and a portion of the 14 billion dollars worth of Army Corps funding to build 315 miles of wall, slats, barriers, mm-hmm. whatever it is. Uh, and this money was set aside to fund projects all over the country, including fix parts of storm damage Puerto Rico, right. uh, fix parts of, of storm damage uh, Texas and uh, California. Um, right. I mean, this is, um, I think, uh, uh, Arizo- uh, Arizona. Um, so he's basically threatening and and it, i imagine it was military officials who leaked this mm-hmm. right like i don't think mm-hmm. it's coming from the white house uh because right. you wouldn't want this to get out there um what, what did, did can you like sense any type of of even strategy here yeah no no the strategy is is really clear um donald trump will do literally anything he has to to pacify his base um now, is that a coherent strategy? No, but that's clearly what he's doing. He's he's pushing this all the way through. Uh, he has a core support of people that they really don't care um, what precedent he has to break, what what lawsuits that will ensue from him doing this, uh, the, what nation or what what groups will lose by him redistributing the funds in a different direction. They really don't care. All that matters is that this wall, in some form, right. Uh, is built. So that's that's the strategy. Now, whether it makes sense or not, you know, that remains to be seen. Um, but, but it seems to me that had he gone on Tuesday night, right, and this must have been the plan from the beginning and announced that mm-hmm. um, that there was a state of emergency, right, and had then, um, you know, at, at that point then sort of announced it, there wouldn't be the time that people have now to sort of like build a political argument against it, right? Like he's only playing to his base, but now he's giving like time for every, all the non-base opposition to really harden. And I, I, that's it. You know, even on his logic, it doesn't seem to make sense. Right. Unless, unless he's doing what, you know, a lot of presidents do, um, more rationally speaking, which is to float this this um, this this trial balloon, right, and and to see um, what actually comes of it, what is the real reaction, and how much will he lose in the end. But he gets a win win out of out of this, no matter what, right. So he's taking a hard line position, public facing. But uh, you know, perhaps this did get leaked from the White House because they know that if they go down this road, there's a, a there's a long line of lawsuits that's going to ensue, as well as um, losing a lot of support from some key Republicans. So it really could be that Donald Trump is playing both sides of the aisle on this, trying to pacify his base while at the same time trying to distance himself from actually pulling the trigger on declaring a national emergency. Because, like you said, if he was going to actually declare that emergency, it would have been Tuesday night in the Oval office um, 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 speech. So how does this resolve? Because, you know, we have uh, Mitch McConnell who, in, in it, you know, like I've got a list here of, it's fascinating, of of who's up for re-election in the Senate in 2020. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, 
there's uh, a lot of Republicans, um, all four of the Republicans who we have heard most of, right? Uh, Shelley Moore uh, Capito mm-hmm. in, in West Virginia. Uh, we've heard from Joni Ernst uh, in Iowa. We've heard, obviously, from um, uh, Collins in Maine. Uh, the only of uh, Cory Gardner in Colorado, uh, who who's, could be in big trouble um, because of this. The only uh, mm-hmm. Republican we've heard from that is not up for re-election is um, uh, uh, Mikowski in uh, in in uh, Alaska, and right, right. Um, they are afraid that they're going to lose <laughs> because right. this is. I mean, we are right on the cusp of it becoming, you know, severe. Right. I mean, right. at one right. point we we are now just at the point where they're not getting uh, uh, paid. Uh, right. We're seeing now in Miami, they're shutting down a terminal for a couple right. of days because TSA people are starting to leave. Um, we're starting to see stuff like loans, you know, to farmers not go through. It is like right now we're on the precipice, I think, of falling off, a, you know, a, a cliff uh, yeah. that is going to be very painful, particularly uh, these senators are going are, are to start feeling the pressure at the same time. You have this opposite force on Mitch McConnell, which is if he allows a vote and undercuts Donald Trump, Trump attacks him, then Mark yeah. Levin and Sean Hannity, and yeah. uh, and they all attack him in a way that he was attacked in 2016. I think he's afraid of getting primaried. So the, it, it, it's cutting both ways, the 2020 election. Right, right. But, but still, and the calculus that Donald Trump is operating through and by is really what's best for him. Right. So clearly he's not going to be concerned with Mitch McConnell in the grand scheme of things. So if, if you're if you're if you know, if you're trying to get an understanding of what Donald Trump is actually doing here, obviously the best way to figure it out is what's going to make him look best, um, what's going to make him uh, his 2020 elec- uh, election more likely. And, you know, he's he's counting on his base, the the Mark Levin, the Sean Hannity's of the radio world, the, the Rush Limbaugh's of the radio world. Um, and and really, I, I accidentally listened to a whole lot of AM um Rush Limbaugh this week and Sean Hannity and the callers that call in. Of course, it's anecdotal, but I wonder like what percentage of people um, actually believe this. There, there were federal workers calling in saying that they were more than happy to suffer through this to secure our border. And and of course, it's an anecdote, but I mean, with that kind of mindset out there. Um, what does Donald Trump really have to lose by playing chicken? And and I think that's what he's calculating. I, I mean, I, yeah, I think uh, from his perspective, but w- at one point, right, the Senate has to give. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No, of course they, they have to give, but I don't see how – see, the real losers in this besides the people who are struggling – the agencies that aren't operating, um, the 80 percent of food that has not been screened, <laughs> besides the American people in general, the other real losers in this is the Republican Party in general, um, starting with the Senate. So they are going to take it on the chin uh, for Donald Trump. And the real question is, are they going to try to salvage anything from this to try to salvage um, the, the Republican Party, which might actually mean a serious conversation about primarying uh, Donald Trump himself? So we it really is going to to be a, a delineate a deciding moment here for the Republican Party are they going to continue to go down with Donald Trump um, and that's a hard calculus when you yeah. consider he does control the base the base is his so I'm not really sure what the uh, what Republicans in the Senate specifically what they can do to come out on top yeah it's it's amazing as I, you know as I look at this list like I I, I feel like um, we're going to see this is where we're going to see people who are going to start to freak out a little bit. Right. It's mm-hmm. um, I mean, I'm surprised that Capito on some level, but I, there must be some huge funding that goes on in uh, in West Virginia. But um, look at someone like Tom Tillis. Right. It's mm-hmm. an R yeah. plus three in North Carolina. Yeah. He's oh, up yeah. for reelection. In That's <laughs> going to be scary for him. Uh, yep. You got someone, you know, obviously Susan Collins who is, um, you know, uh, uh, up for re-election. Iowa, Joni Ernst. I would say even David Perdue in Georgia, maybe, uh, because, you know, that's that's supposedly an R plus five uh, state, but that state moved quite a bit the past two yes. years. And yeah, in two years, here. yeah, very interesting, right? Like the percentage of African-American vote went up by one or two points in terms of right. what making up the electorate, and that's not going to help David Perdue. 
uh, in two <laughs> years. Uh, Corey Gardner is in big trouble. But then you see someone like Lindsey Graham. I think Lindsey mm-hmm. Graham is also operating the same way that McConnell is. How do I stave off a yes. primary challenge? Right. right? Like right. that's what they're worried about, These some of those people. So all the so-called, well, I don't know that Mitch McConnell is a, uh, is a moderate, but, you know, and Lindsey Graham has certainly cha- changed. I mean, Lindsey Graham is afraid of getting um, primaried by a— um, by a uh, you know a, 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 Trump a, Trump, Republican. a Trump Republican, yeah, yeah. No, no. This is this is the this is like the B side of the of the of the dance, right? This is the the second act, if you would, of Donald Trump actually seizing full control over the Republican Party, and and it really is just going to be reflective of who has an identity. Uh, in the Republican Party. What is the Republican Party's identity outside of Donald Trump? And the problem is, is that a lot of the policies they never disagreed on. They just didn't like the way he presented himself. Well, now we have a policy that is clearly detrimental to them politically, whether they agree with them on the wall or not. It's now gotten to a point where it's detrimental to their political futures. And we have to see, like, what, what, where are they going to bargain? How are they going to play this out? Um, you've already, like you said, Lindsey Graham. He's doubling down on Trump, but there's so many other Republicans that are going to be in trouble if this continues down this road. And um, so far, I actually have no idea. I, I have no inclination as to when Donald Trump will blink on this, if at all. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. The real question is going to be: see, is, is does Mitch McConnell? And mm. how do they open up on Mitch McConnell? I mean, it, it, I, I feel like Mitch McConnell is going to have to like feign a heart attack go into the hospital so that this can happen when he's like i i was i was in the hospital i couldn't i couldn't do anything about it um all right well let's uh, turn our attention to the uh other um i guess um you know it takes two to tango as you know Ugh. and so uh part of the responsibility for the government closing yeah, uh, you're uh, obviously uh, talking about the AP headline. Oh, my goodness. Yes. That had to be the very worst I've ever seen ever. But go ahead. I'm sorry. Well, yes, exactly. It's uh, it's the Democrats. And um, I mean, I think like, look, they're pushing for uh, the, they're pr- pr- uh, ap- uh, applying pressure in um, in um, uh, in in the Senate. I, I, I don't hear Mitch McConnell's name enough, frankly. But yeah, uh, right. But that's that. Um but uh, l- let's talk about first uh, what's happening with um, the the committee assignments. Just briefly, there was a story. Uh, well, uh, at the beginning of this uh, formation of the uh, this uh, session of Congress, mm-hmm. the uh, the CPC, the uh, uh, the Progressive uh, Caucus, right. Um, had negotiated with Nancy Pelosi 40 percent representation and on uh, four or five uh, of the sort of really tier one uh, committees like Ways and Means and, and, and a couple others. And they have more or less gotten to 40 percent. However, some of those people who are members of the CPC are also members of uh, the new Democratic <laughs> coalition. And yeah. You know, part of the problem is that the CPC has not quite organized itself in such a way that it is as meaningful to call yourself that. Right. Like there's no anybody can join. And Mm -hmm. so um, uh, Pelosi just basically got away with what she could get away with, which is I you want me to put CPC members on. I did. I can't. It's not up to me to police your caucus. Right. As to how legit they are. Um, (laughs) Now, uh, the Financial Services Committee is looking like it could be a pretty good committee. It's a a tier two committee, but it's an important committee. Uh, AOC is going to may end up on there. And um, a couple of um, uh, maybe uh, Katie Porter, a couple of, you know, very strong freshman Congress uh, 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 people. But. What's your sense of of like, you know, how the progressives are doing here? And let's roll into this. The uh, attacks on uh, AOC in Politico. Let's just put up that first tweet that she did. She um, she she responded. The the first one that I sent you. Yeah, here it is. Uh, She responded to someone tweeting out. 
uh, AOC isn't the future of the Democratic Party. This is Joe Lieberman. Yeah. And uh, she tweeted out, uh, new party, who dis? We're going to talk more <laughs> about uh, AOC, about Joe Lieberman uh, on Sunday. But, uh, yeah. but that, and then look what she put here uh, in response to, I think, the Politico uh, piece. Go back to that other one. Um, yeah. Uh, here it is. Um, she wrote, uh, to quote Alan Moore, none of you understand. I'm not locked up in here with you. You're locked up here <laughs> I with love me. It. I loved it. Um, Absolutely. So uh, just give me your take about what's going on here. So, no, I, I think you nailed it, right? Um, Nancy, they, I don't know who to blame or who to credit in, in uh, the CPC assignments, um, because I think Nancy Pelosi did exactly what I would have done if I was in her position. Um, if I have my, you know, I cannot control the fact that your caucus is not as progressive as it needs to be. But if that's the measure that you want to use, then fine. Bring them on in and we could fill in those positions. Um, that makes total sense. And I, I, I think it is more of a reflection on um, how unorganized progressives were prior to this moment, which is why I'm glad you tied AOC in this, um, because there really is the need for a much more organized representation in uh, in the Congress. Right. We we've been progressive in the streets. Now we need to be progressive um, on the Hill and and not just progressives in name only to I hate to steal that from Republicans. But, you know, we really do need people who aren't just signed up with the committee, but also actually hold progressive positions. Now, this is the problem with Democrats across the board that everyone has talked about for years, the fact that we don't really have true progressivism represented in the party. And this is why everyone is so upset or so uh, befuddled with uh, uh, AOC, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, because she's coming in talking about a, a top marginal rate of 70%. I That's, a, that's as progressive, uh, progressive as we've heard in my lifetime, I've never heard anyone go in there just off the rip and say, no, this is where what we should consider her Green New Deal. Uh, so that type of boldness and brashness is the only thing that's going to draw out the progressives. Uh, if there's any progressives amongst us, what AOC is doing is going to draw them out. And if they're not there, then we need to really honestly talk about doing some more primary because, you know, there are no locked positions. There are no locked seats. These The seats belong to the people. And if the people demand more progressives, then I, I think Ocasio-Cortez's storyline and the way she did it and now how bold she is, is really going to inspire more progressives to be there in the first place so that Speaker Pelosi doesn't have that easy hand to play of um, assigning progressives when progressives when in reality they're just third way Democrats with the label of progressive. You know, uh, I mean, I, 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 I am of the mind that we should be uh, actively um you know, looking for Democrats to primary, you know, and and, you know, we should expend those resources wisely um, mm -hmm. and, and it should mm -hmm. be in places where you have a, uh, you know, there should be no Democratic seat that is a D plus 10 where someone doesn't have a 100 percent uh, progressive voting record in my estimation. Right. Exactly. And, and that's the type of thing. The real question is, is like from a tactical standpoint, um, how much should AOC be saying this, right? Because they, and, and, and when, uh, mm -hmm. because, you know, the problem is, is that they're afraid of her costing them some of their jobs. <laughs> that's, mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> I mean, that's basically what it comes down to. Right. Yeah, and, yeah. um, and, and, well, then they need to sh they need to sh put up or shut up. Right. So if they're there and they have the opportunity to be more progressive and, and Ocasio-Cortez, the answer to your question is she needs to do it now. Then. Right. Let's do it now, because it it, it may cause more waves than she wants to cause at this point. But we need to flesh this out. If you want to keep your seat and the wave, the real blue wave is a progressive wave then you need to become progressive. Have a have a change of heart. Have a coming to Jesus moment. Have a come to Ocasio-Cortez moment where you change your ways and you actually operate and vote based on progressive politics. Otherwise, then, yeah, you, you, you don't have a safe seat and not be progressive. I'm sorry. And um, and what of I mean, to what extent do you think that that she can be essentially uh, punished? within the con <laughs> no, I mean like you know like yeah. uh, you know yeah. 
And the thing is, is that she has a fairly safe seat, right? Uh, certainly as a Democrat. And in terms of primarying, it seems to me she has the ability to at least keep pace with the the most well-funded possible primary challenger she could right. get, right? I mean, uh, absolutely. like she has an ability to raise money, it seems to me at this point, that uh, is unrivaled yeah. by the vast- Anybody, yeah. anyone. And yeah. at least in, in, in the house. And, yeah. um, and so she's there, she's safe. She doesn't have to worry about that as much. Um, and she's basically, it seems to me, taking- the political strength she has and using it. And that's necessarily going to step on other people's toes. Right. And, and, and that to me seems to be like the first order issue in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, of what the dynamic is. I mean, I think people are in some way uh, threatened by her, um, her ideal, you know, her, her positions, but I think yeah. it's more, they're threatened by her power and, right. and in its power, she's not, you know, She's not fully even wielding it yet. Right. Right. She, she, she's, she's doing sort a of great like, job. There's like a little bit of Serpico situation here <laughs> where everybody's like, you know, if you don't take the money, mm -hmm. nobody's mm -hmm. going to trust you. And exactly. you can take the money and then just give it back to somebody, but you got to take the money. So everybody trusts you. Um, right. And I, I feel like it's more about that rather than, uh, you know, directly or politics. I think that's a second order at this juncture anyways. Yeah. Um, because it's just, you know, she's not uh, uh, getting along to go along type of situation. I think that scares right. people. Right. Well, I think it's I think it's um, almost I, I agree with you, but I can see how it would be one and the same. Her politics uh, is exactly what threatens their positions. Like if they had her politics, they wouldn't be threatened. Right. They they would be glad to have a champion in Ocasio-Cortez. So uh, sure, their jobs are threatened. But and I, 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 I'm loath to offer anyone advice because I know she's a brilliant woman and she does not need my little old advice from from down here in Georgia. But I would say never, ever don't bat an eye. Fight as hard as you possibly can because they will destroy you whether you're fighting for the right. right thing or whether you're not fighting for the right thing. Never, I mean, anyone extending their arms out to hug you and asking you to to uh, to 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 rein you in, right? Asking you to back down, they want to destroy you. I don't care how big of a smile they have on their face. I don't care what race they are. I don't care what gender they are. They want to destroy you, so you might as well destroy them first. It is a blood bloodbath, dog eat dog, and I think she knows that, which is why she came out swinging with 70% of a tax, top tax margin of rate. So um, just push, keep going, just keep going. Yeah, let's also just, I want to touch on that for a moment, because one of the things I thought was amazing when, when we talked a little bit about this week was watching Julian Castro, who mm -hmm. um, I would be surprised if there is a any type of record, video, audio, or written, of him ever acknowledging that the top tax rate was, uh, you know, 90% in the 50s or 60s uh, mm. in his entire political history, uh, but for this week when he was asked about AOC's comments. That, to me, is stunning. I mean, I feel yeah. like we're seeing what we saw with single payer in Bernie. We're seeing the same thing in terms of the taxation uh, yeah. with AOC. It's just like they start talking about it and they force other people to talk about it. And then all of a sudden it doesn't sound so crazy. Right. Right. She's pushing the Overton window over, man. Like this is, this is critical in, in our discourse. So maybe one day we don't get back up to 70%, but we get up to 50% or, or, or whatever. It won't happen unless people just get out there and say what is true and what is obvious. But that is, you know, shame, shame on the Democrats who, I, you know, these things, you're fully aware of the progressive positions that we've had in this uh, this country's history, and you understand that we're nothing like that now. So, we're, you know, shame on them. Like, I don't even want to go down the road of like, what are you actually there for? Because we all can have our our our, um, our own way of thinking about that. You know, we all have our own guess. But the fact is, it's like, <sighs> do they need a leader? Obviously, should they have to wait on someone to to open up the door for these conversations? No, they should have been. Julian Castro should have been that guy, right? But he wasn't. So thank God for uh, AOC. Um, and any thoughts about um, uh, uh, Elizabeth Warren and um, <laughs> her jumping into the race? Yeah, man. I just 
honestly, I, I have a love hate relationship with with uh, the idea of Elizabeth Warren being president. Um, I think she missed her boat. Uh, I think 2016 was her year. Um, I, I think Bernie. I don't think Bernie would have run if she jumped in with the run run Liz Warren campaign. Um, but you know, I like her still. I, I, I like most some of her politics. And I'm generally a fan and always have been and probably will be. But I think she missed the boat. All right, so what do you mean by that? Like, it just it's it just uh, the, the you have your moment, man. Right. Everybody has their moment and you got to seize that moment. Her moment was 2016. By yeah. God, like we we wanted uh, Amer- it was time for America to have a woman president just by just sheer numbers and demographics like this. We should have had one a long time ago. It was time for America to have a progressive candidate. It was time for us to have Elizabeth Warren. And and that's not this year. This year, we need something else. This year, we need somebody who can get in the ring and like eviscerate Donald Trump and come out not looking like a pig. You know what I mean? You get in the, in the, in the slop, you generally come out looking like a pig. We need someone who is a talented fighter enough to get in the mud with him and still come out looking good. And she's not that person, man. Did you see what Trump did with her campaign slogan? One twenty twentieth. Right. <laughs> you know, so she's already, you know, in my opinion, she's missed her vote. She's not up to the to the task of beating Donald Trump. But I absolutely do like her her politics. I, I respect her as a person, as a senator. I love what she's done. And if she's the candidate, I will wear her t shirt and and go out there and support her to no end. But just we're in the early stages where we can really make smart decisions. I don't know if this is her time anymore. Who are you thinking? I didn't want to go down this road quite yet. But I'm just, all right, you don't tell me. We'll wait. We got plenty. We got, about the, we got yeah. plenty of time to talk about this. Yeah. But, um, yeah. Um, yeah. Inter- interesting take. I mean, I guess we'll see. I'm. I'm. I'm curious to find out how all this stuff plays when yeah. we see the campaign actually roll out. Uh, like, do you primary. think that I know we don't want to go down here. Do, do you feel she's up to the task of taking on Trump? Uh, I mean, I I don't have a sense yet. I mean, I really okay. I, I, you know, I I personally don't think that anybody should roll around in the mud with Trump. Uh, mm. I am of the school of uh, you should dismiss him very quickly and don't get into and just let him roll around in the mud. Okay. Um, and uh, because. I don't think at the end of the day, the one twenty twenty, uh, you know, thing is really going to have much resonance. Um, I think it will on the right. They will hype it up. But I think the dynamic is 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 not too dissimilar from this wall situation. Mm. Donald Trump may very well uh, call for a state of an emergency. He mm-hmm. will not. He he will not build the wall. He will he will try and get the money appropriated. And it will immediately be tied up in the courts. Those court cases will last well beyond 2020. Yeah, for uh, sure. They will. Those court cases will end when the next president comes in and says, yeah, we're not going to do that anymore. Mm-hmm. And so mm-hmm. nothing's going to get built. But there will be 40 to 45 percent of the, the country, maybe maybe closer to 40, who are going to be ecstatic mm-hmm. that he did this. Mm-hmm. And um, the Republicans will still take the brunt of the shutdown and we'll move on. And I have a feeling that is like the same dynamic with the 2020. I think there are more people fretting about the implications of that one twenty two twenty thing mm-hmm. than um, than the um, than than it actually having any impact. Well, I, I agree with like everything that you said there with with one caveat that that stuff really drives his base and drives them to the polls. That's the big thing. Like the wall. Yeah, some Republicans are going to take it on the chin, but his base, they're coming out. You know what I mean? They, the, 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 the bigotry towards um, Elizabeth Warren and her, her ancestry and all that stuff, you know, it, it, it drives his base, but it drives them to the polls also. They love this. Adam Seward in the, from the Atlantic, he, he coined it best. The cruelty is the point. And so we just have to see if, if, um, if we can find a candidate on our side that can overcome the energy that Donald Trump still surprisingly gets from his base that, I mean, they're coming out to the polls. But of course they're going to come out to the polls, right? I mean... But can we overcome it, though? I, 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 I mean, the, the numbers that he had with, with the candidate who brings people out on, um, uh, against him, I think that 
we uh, undoubtedly. I mean, you think about the numbers he had relative to Mitt Romney. I think they were even less. It's just that um, last time the Democratic candidate severely underperformed. Mm -hmm. And that was Mm -hmm. a big part of the problem. Um, Yeah. And so. um, And so, I mean, we can't go down. We we can't have a candidate who underperforms and under motivates us. You know what I mean? That's that's part of the calculus. And I think that's part of the calculus of of Elizabeth Warren. Like, I, I hate to put it like this, but running for president is like a high school popularity contest as much as anything else. And and when I say she missed her moment, part of it is like, you know, I don't know if she has that juice, Same that energy. That, yeah. that energy to make America excited enough to get to make the left of America excited enough to get everyone to the polls. Now, again, I, I will if she's a nominee, whoever, I don't care who the right. nominee is. Right. I'm going to sell them like this. is. We're just having a conversation on, on, on your show. But when it, when we get down to brass tacks, man, I'm going to knock on doors for whoever it is. Right. Right. Uh, I am fully in Martin O'Malley's corner right now. <laughs> ben, <laughs> every every step of the way. Ben Dixon. Uh, folks can check out the, the Benjamin Dixon show. And I guess uh, we are a little bit less than a, or a little bit more than a month away. Uh, from the official from launch. Northstar.com. All or right. Northstar.com. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me, Thanks, Sam. Ben. It's always a pleasure. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Ben Dixon, folks. Um, where did Michael go? Did Michael just leave? Uh, he said he had to duck out early, earlier than expected today. Yeah, that was even earlier than I expected. What? What? what why? Why did he even come in? Just to uh, to put more crumbs on the uh, floor? Guy doesn't clean up after himself. We're gonna <laughs> research the the cookie that uh, is sitting on the on the carpet there on the floor. It's such torture for me when you throw shade on Michael because I love throwing shade on Michael, but I will also never side with the boss against a coworker because I'm not a scab. I know. That's very difficult. I know that's his line. That's been his line for a long time. But uh, you should also know that he's also part of management, right? I mean, he he's in here. Mm. He's bossing around. Uh, so uh, I understand. Maybe he thinks he is. He threw me under the bus for the Coke bottles yesterday. He did. And he didn't even realize he was doing it. When he yeah, did it. that's right. He's the boss, right? Like he's the he's he, he, he's part of management. So uh, you might want to rethink that take. He's posing. He's just posing as worker, but he's more management than worker at this point. I'll take that under advisement. Going off on his uh, wherever he's going. I mean, come on. Um, Oh, he's working on material. Is that that's not what he said? <laughs> God, oh my God! All right, folks, um, we're gonna uh, take a, a quick break, and when we come back, we will be talking to Matthew, film guy, and uh, he will give us a film. Maybe we'll talk a little bit about Force Majeure because uh, uh, Matthew had originally uh, recommended it, and then I was um, uh, a friend instructed me to uh, watch it, and so. We'll see. Um, All right. Quick break. Come back. Matthew Foam Guy.
On the majority report, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, from time to time, uh, we have, well, I mean, we always, well, originally we were, this, this uh, segment of the program on Fridays for our new listeners and, and viewers uh, was um, held down by a, uh, uh, who I thought at the time was a film critic. And it turned out he was posing as a film critic. He was not a film critic. He was just a entertainment reporter. And he kept recommending films that were bad. And one day I was like, you do, you do, like, these are bad films that you're recommending. You're not a great film critic. And he's like, I'm not a film critic. And that happened, that took like four years, I think we were doing it. And then I was like, well, why would I, then you're not going to be on anymore. I'm going to get someone who's a real film guy. Well, you don't have to be a film yeah. critic to have good taste. Film guy. He's both. Matthew the film guy is choosing your streams. Cassavetes on Netflix and other such themes. Write me on what I want to learn a few things. Please recommend me a movie to stream. Matthew! Matthew! Please recommend me a movie to stream. Matthew! Matthew! Film guy! And Matthew Film Guy is uh, one of those people who uh, comes on uh, to uh, recommend films. Hello, Matthew Film Guy. Hello, Sam Cedar. How are you doing today? I am. Uh, I am doing well. Um, uh, thank you for joining us. This is your first uh, visit to the show in 2019. Uh, do yes. I have that correct? Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Uh, can we still say that this far in? But Happy New Year to you, Sam. We're only ten days away from uh from the actual new year so i would say uh, yes we're still at the beginning of the year um you could maybe say happy beginning of the year happy beginning of the year sam you know i'm talking to you from my mother's lanai in sunny boca raton where time dilates very severely so it's hard to keep track very nice so you're in boca huh did you go to uh um... that's right there's a uh, Tequila Willie's there, if I remember correctly, uh, in Boca, where you can get um, uh, tequila shots out of a um, a, a beholstered waitress. Um, now, this, of course, um, was the last time I was there was in 1987, I think it was. Um, I was uh, I drove down to Florida with a buddy of mine, and we stayed at. His grandmother's place uh, in Boynton Beach, I think. There you uh, go. One of those like gated community uh, place. Um, That's right. And we went to Tequila Willie's and got some uh, got some tequila shots. And then I think we we took mushrooms and went to um, um, Disney World. Hell yeah! That's, That's a, happiest place That's, on earth. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty much what I'm doing here. Just me, Mary, and the dog taking mushrooms and drinking tequila. All right. Well, that's nice. And so are you, have you guys gone to Tequila Willie's? Is that still there? Have you checked that out? Or? You know what? I don't know if it's Tequila Willie's, but there is. I passed a place that was sort of a themed tequila bar across from the Super Target, which we have frequented several times. And I have not yet gone in, but maybe on your recommendation, I will amend that policy. Uh, I'm sorry. Did you say the Super Target? That's right. They don't just have Targets down here, Sam. They have Super Targets. So I can get a bath mat and turkey bacon. All oh, hell yeah. Well, that, that reminds me of the middle of the country really hard. Yep. Wait, have you been to a super Target? That's the main form of Target where I'm from. Seriously. So the, oh, you, you come from the land of the super Target. Yep. God, I just had to go to the one at Atlantic Center Terminal the other day to get stuff for my new house. And that was quite enough Target for me. That's a sub super <laughs> Target. That's like a... That's the sub Target. Jesus. So wait a second. So is, is a super Target just like Target, but like... Like, how much? Massive, just massive. It's got a supermarket. It's got everything made in China ever inside it under one roof. It's fantastic. And um, hard to miss the super target, right? Mm, Is that their their slogan? Uh, Can I get the soundboard up, please? Yep, there you go. There we go. (laughs) This doesn't seem to be. Yeah, the best part of the super. There you go. Yeah, no, I mean, apart from Super Target, I'm sort of down here on an extended sabbatical. Uh, you know, we took a long road trip down from New York. We drove, so we oh, saw did? the country on the East Coast. 
And I'm um, just sort of here taking in movies, the beach, and other dog-friendly locales. So how long are you uh, taking this extended sabbatical? I'm, this is starting to sound enticing and alluring to me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, come on down, Sam. We got a couch. Well, no, no, I, 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 I wouldn't, I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't do it with you. I, All right. That's not what I'm no talking pressure. about. No I'm pressure, no pressure. saying the idea. There's plenty of other Lenai's the idea and other gated one. communities just, with other Jewish grandmas here. Yes, no, I don't doubt it, but I'm just curious as to how long are you going to be on the sabbatical for? Uh, you know what? Since we drove, it's a little open-ended. I can be doing some work down here. I'm actually working on Ted Alexandro's new podcast, A Little Bit Me, which you can find on iTunes and Stitcher and all those other places. So I'm kind of, you know, have computer world travel. So it could be a couple more weeks. It could be another month. Uh, you know, life's my oyster, Sam. That is, uh, I'm, I gotta say, I'm a little jealous. I mean, the idea of like getting out of the, the cold for a month and a half is pretty sweet. Now, what happens to your learning annex class? Actually, that is one of the hard outs that I have. So that resumed in the middle of February. So that will probably be the one thing that does bring me back. But you know what? The ladies there love me so much. I refer you to the gift cards that I received uh, that I could probably (laughs) skip even one of those classes and still not really, you know, damage my long term prospects there. Wait a second. If you skip, do you send in a sub? Oh, no, they just they, they wouldn't take a sub. They just come back the next week and they get like a minor refund. Wow. But uh, if anyone's listening from my class, I still plan to be there. I think it's February 13th, but, um, you know, keep your eye on your email. Do you have members of that class who listen to this program? You know, I have certainly mentioned it before, but I don't know how many of them, the Venn diagram of the people who show up and the people who can listen to a podcast online, it may not exactly overlap very much, so I, I can't say for sure. Okay, um, that sounds uh, like you made some modicum of effort to get people to listen. That's fine. Yeah, uh, like I would basically have to show up at each of their houses and show them how to download iTunes and so on, and that's just I don't get paid quite enough for that. But I have mentioned it, and I think a few people have told me that they have heard of it at least, like they heard of you. Maybe. Well, yeah, that's I think not, I I mean, that's not so. really what I'm looking for, but uh, that's, yeah. that's nice. Uh, no, I certainly stump for the show every chance I get. You know that, Sam. Yeah, okay. Uh, I just thought that we were bringing in some of those folks, but that's okay. Um, all right. Well, we're not. Um, now, Matthew. I'll tell you what, Sam. I'll, set, I'll put out a survey next class, and uh, we'll see. We'll get the real numbers for you. Okay, good. Good. Now, let's get to this film thing, because there's a little bit of a controversy here. Um, that Now that I'm, I'm checking my phone, um, I was quite convinced that you recommended to me on this program force majeure uh i don't know when it came out the, the, I assume the legal it, concept not the legal concept the movie oh, okay. force majeure and i never heard of it somebody recommended it was it isabel i don't yeah, know it could Maybe. have been one of your other myriad film guys i don't know but was it good yeah I, it was great um, it's, do you want me to tell you a little bit about it? I mean, I'm Let's very see. surprised you that you don't even know. Put on your film guy hat and go to town. I'm, I'm very surprised that you don't know, uh, what this movie is. I don't know who recommended it to me, but, um, force majeure, of course, the, the concept itself is, you know, sort of, uh, is, uh, a, a, a legal, uh, term. Um, and that is an unforeseeable, uh, very often natural uh, event or circumstance that keeps someone from being able to fulfill a contract, right? So um, if uh, there's, uh, you know, you got a, a hotel reservation and, um, you know, the hotel gets uh, swept away in a flood and there's no hotel, you know, it's force majeure. There's, I'm sorry, we can't give you the room, that type of thing. Um, that may not be the greatest of examples, but that's it. Um, so, the uh, the movie Force Majeure, though, was released in 2014. I'm looking at this. Um, I'm surprised you didn't see this because it got the Gold Buggage Award for Best Picture, um, which I don't know. It's a it's a um, it's a foreign film. I think it's uh, Swedish. Is it? It's a Swedish uh, film by uh, Ruben Ostlund, and um, 
I think they probably dubbed it in English, but uh, or maybe there's a little bit of English, I, I, or maybe there's a little bit of English that they actually speak. Um, and uh, I didn't recognize any of the people in it except for the guy who plays the um, Christoph Hizh. Uh, the guy who plays the uh, the redheaded guy What's from, that again? from the uh, Christian or something, uh, guy who played uh, the the redhead in uh, Game of Thrones, um, and um, it's. Do you want me to tell? Well, how much? I don't know how to do this. I don't know how to do it with it. It's your it's your show, Sam. You can use the time well, as you I, I'm it. not. I'm not really. Uh, uh, this is not a spoiler, really, because it's. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's, we don't it's, have any repeats of James Bond Gate. Yeah, I mean, it's not a it's not a major uh, spoiler. It's but it's about a relationship and something happens. And oh, I love movies where something happens. I also love movies where something doesn't. Well, that's right. And something happens that causes uh, the wife to see her husband in a new light. Uh, and it's a little oh. bit uh, problematic, and it's sort of uh, you know it's a, it's a bit of a sad time. Starting to see your attraction to this movie. What? Uh, what? Why is that? Oh, maybe not. Never mind. No, 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 uh, no, uh, no. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't have any bearing on uh, uh, on my my former uh, marriage. I don't think. No. Okay. Um, right. No, Never but it's it, uh, it's just a a revealing uh, moment, and it's pretty funny the way, and it's about uh, you know gender roles and about what we uh, expect about people and what um, I mean. I, it's something I thought that I, I it's it sounds like your kind of movie, and I can't believe you didn't see it. Well, I will certainly rectify that oversight right away. I mean, I'm down here with about 500 other movies that I've been trying to see without having the real time. You know, I'm trying to see like the two hour plus three hour plus movies. Um, but I will throw that into the rotation. I promise you. What it seems the student has become the film guy. That's right. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Sam, you've turned the tables. I've tra- I've, le- I've learned you well. What, what films have you brought down there with you? Do you bring down like uh, Blu-rays? Do you bring down your own Blu-ray player when you're driving down to, uh, to uh, Boca? No, I buy movies. I download movies. You know, I'm a member of some of these uh, invite-only torrent sites, so I trade movies with other cinephiles and things like that. So I've just uh, amassed a hard drive full of uh, digital copies of movies that just need to be seen eventually. And how do you and, watch uh, those? Do you watch those on your computer? Do you have a means in which yeah, you... Yeah, you, uh, you get an HDMI cord that plugs right into your computer. We have Mary's laptop. It goes right into the computer. I got a nice Bose sound bar that I got my mother to buy for her uh, 60 inch flat screen here. So we've got somewhat of a fairly good audio setup going and uh, yeah, you just hit VLC player. Shout out to VLC player. Thank you God for VLC player. And uh, you just go to town on it, Sam. Oh, and then you play it on the TV. Is that it? That's right. On the TV. Yeah. Big screen TV, bucket of popcorn sometimes. All Get right. Back. So Matthew, in for, a file. for a moment, we're all going to pretend that we're in our mother's or maybe just your mother's living room in Boca. And uh, we have the opportunity to sit back and watch a movie because, hey, we're in Florida. Why wouldn't you want to stay inside? Exactly, um, Sam. I'm glad you, you catch my meaning. <laughs> God forbid you would go out in the dead of winter and want to get uh, some sun and maybe go swimming or something. You know, it's nice to know that it's out there. You know, it's just nice to know that it's out there. What's no, that's not true. We've been outside a little bit. There's so many dog outside. friendly places here. There's dog parks. There's dog beaches. So we've 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 seen the outside. Believe me, that's Mary's main. What's the temperature? We do get some. What's the temperature D. out there? Actually, it's like a really nice about 74 right now oh where I'm sitting. I'm in shade. It's nice and cool. So it's not super hot, but it's uh, quite comfortable. I I I, I want to kill you. Right you just now. can't think <laughs> about these things if you're going to live in New York. I, I, I honestly. You really want to know. I really, I shouldn't ask that question. I mean, I, I honestly, listen, right now, listen, just, I, I, I want to end your life. It took life. me over 20 years, 20 years of living in New York to really realize I don't have to tough it out. I don't have to wake up either burning hot because of the steam heat or freezing cold because I've had to go somewhere. And really, I have to owe it. I owe it to Mary. I have to give her the credit for getting me out of my uh, uh, sedentary lifestyle and saying we could actually take advantage of the fact that your mother lives in Florida. And we have. Son of a gun. I'm mad now. All right. Well, so <laughs> what, uh, what dumb movie do you want to recommend, Matthew, as you sit there living <laughs> life by the pool? 
Well, I've. Uh, do you I've day drink when you're there? Go- do you day drink? Because I can't. I'm, that's all no. I'm thinking about now is like uh, yeah, going that, down, that sitting by the pool, speed. and day drinking. That's what I want to do. I just want to be able I to can- ride my bike to work, so it doesn't take me an hour to get oh, here on a bus. It would be nice. Day drink, ride around a uh, gated uh, community in Boca. Maybe get and a little cup a pool. holder for my bike. Yeah. You know, I don't know if I'd take my life in my hands driving, riding a bike around the streets of Boca. It's like all six lane highways here, so that's a little scary proposition. But now, uh, now is she, is she in like one of those communities, or does she have like just like a, a co, like a like a you know like a condo, like an apartment type of situation? One of those communities. I mean, they're you know they're semi attached, just like two and three kind of fit together. But it's one of those little, you know, Boca del Boca type. Seinfeld places, yeah. All right, but can't you ride your bike around there? Like, uh, is it? Like, yes, that's what I mean. You could ride your bike around here, but you, you wouldn't actually go right, anywhere. No, you wouldn't want to go you anywhere know, else, that. right? Now, is there a golf course yeah. associated with that, or, or is that just? You no, know, I don't think this one. I don't, I don't think this one does. But there's like every third one at the golf course. Right. So you know, we're, right. we're right across the street from a giant mall that has like a Tesla store and an Apple store and a of course. Cartier inside it. So it's like that's what you're kind of dealing with here. Oh okay. I'm just I feel kidding. like you're like living in that episode of Broad City where they go visit someone's grandma in Boca and they're like, oh my God, this is so great. We're totally going to move here. And then they find out that all the old Jewish people in this Florida uh, complex are like racist and <laughs> right wing. Benjamin and I, <laughs> and Benjamin wrote about this in his book uh, and, he, and he didn't credit me as the other person. But we got. Uh, I know. We pitched a show to uh, Conan O'Brien's production company of uh, two guys who go down and live. Uh, they, I think it was called Early Retirement. And they would go down to a retirement place and basically move in. Uh, they figure out a way of, of doing that, move in with their, with their grandparents or, or something like that. Broad City copied you. Oh, yeah. This is uh, years later, the Broad City, of course. Everybody copied us. Um, and what we did, we, we went down there and we visited uh, his father-in-law at the time. Not his father-in-law, his brother-in-law's father. Uh, and who was like um, a self-styled comedian and was like sort of like in doing, uh, would do productions in the, uh, the, um, in the, uh, uh, the old, in, in, in the community. And so... Um, we ended up, I mean, John convinced me to do this. You can read the book uh, to find out exactly how it, it happened, even though he doesn't mention my name. He just says my writing partner or whatever. Um, John convinced me to, uh, to give up part of the money that we were making to write the script to this guy to write the script for us. And he was a 70-year-old man who wrote a sitcom that read like a 70-year-old man was writing a sitcom uh at that time and we handed it in as a joke it was all just a joke um and the response from the executives was like we feel like you're i mean it's good it's good uh but we feel like you're (laughs) writing something that we you think we would think is funny and we want you to write something that you think is funny and we're like what we think this is great and and then eventually we just handed in our script and they were just like why did you do that? And we we're like, well, we thought it was, and, was funny. <laughs> and don't forget, don't forget to include the disbursement of the money that you were given to this guy, basically, right? Oh yeah, we gave him about ten percent of what we of what our contract was. I mean, we paid him like uh, I don't know, like five, six thousand dollars or something. Sounds like, like it was worth it. I mean, it was uh, it was uh, it, it was a funny story. Benjamin monetized it, I guess, by writing it in his damn book. Mm-hmm. Anyways, uh, so what do you recommend as a movie, Matthew Film Guy? Well, I've got a couple here because I've been seeing them at a kind of a, a, a fast clip here. Okay. Um, and I've been going back through some of the classics of the early 70s, which was, as mm. everybody knows, a kind of heyday for Hollywood filmmaking. Well, you do. could have sort of major movie stars that probably seen still were in those. movies. that. Were... What's that? I've probably seen those. Well, let's, let's see. Because th- then I've got the big hitter follow it up with but a few that i watched just to sort of uh catch up on some was scarecrow with al pacino and gene hackman do you know that one no okay great glad to hear it scarecrow it's uh it's uh directed by uh, jerry uh, schatzberg who did uh panic in needle park this was his follow-up with uh-huh. al pacino 
It's uh, quite the sort of uh, downbeat, but really kind of uh, intense 70s sort of milieu about two sort of down on the left guys who strike up a, a, an odd friendship and sort of have these dreams. It's a little bit of a midnight cowboy. I was just going to say, sounds thing. midnight cowboyish. Yeah. It probably got green lighted due to the success of Midnight Cowboy a few years earlier. Interesting. Then I watched. Uh, then I watched a, uh, a sort of a neo noir, but this one takes place in the great city of Boston, very seedy underbelly of Boston in the early seventies. The Friends of Eddie Coyle. You know this one? No, I don't. Yeah, these are great. These are little like lesser known, sort of minor key seventies movies. This is uh, directed by Peter Yates, and it's got um, uh, the 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 uh, the great Robert Mitchum. Peter Boyle, Alex Rocco, those kind of guys. And it's just sort of like a low-key, I want to say gangster movie, just like criminals movie. And it's very sort of um, sort of that? ambient storytelling, not a lot of plot, but such great shitty Boston of the early 70s milieu. So there you've was, got to see that one. during the heyday of the indie world, there was a movie like that about Boston with like two or three guys who were like petty criminals. I can't remember what the name of that movie was. Are you thinking of Palookaville? Maybe. Okay. All right. What else? You but, got? and now here's the one that I think everyone should go out and see just because of its sort of relevance to our current state of political affairs. I don't always do that with my reviews, but in this one, I thought it was pretty relevant. Actually, Mary and I watched uh, the documentary. This is not the one, but we watched uh, the great documentary. I am not your Negro about James Baldwin, which if everybody hasn't seen oh, that, it, that won a lot of awards a couple of years ago. It's an incredible documentary on him. And that sort of sent us down a YouTube rabbit hole watching some of these um, panels that he was on in the early and mid 60s. Um, and and that inspired me to see a little known movie directed by none other than Roger Corman, who you wouldn't expect a movie like this from. He made his name, as you know, making low budget schlock horror movies. Right. Some of them actually very interesting. He gave a, a career start to so many of the people that went on to make bigger movies like Martin Scorsese and Ron Howard and Peter Fonda and Jack Nicholson and uh, James Cameron and just tons of people over the years. But he directed a movie starring none other than Captain Kirk himself, William Shatner, called The Intruder. Have you heard of this movie, Sam? No, I have not. Okay, it's really not released, but it is on YouTube. And it basically is about a, a real, a grifter go, comes down from, I guess he says he's from Hollywood, he's from L.A., and he comes down to a uh, southern town who is struggling in the wake of integration. And they're sort of begrudgingly accepting the fact that their children have to go to school with black people. And he stirs up trouble to basically um, aggrandize himself and becomes this kind of almost cult leader of these southern racists. And I don't have to draw the parallels for you for our current president. But um, I will. It's like Trump. Our president is Trump, and he's like Trump. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Uh, that makes it easier um, so, to follow where you're yeah. going with that. Just in case, just in case. Um, and, yeah, and it's William Shatner being his purest shatner the best Shatner you could ever Shatner. And he's this kind of, uh, you know, literally a race hustler, a, you know, race pimp. What, are the, what does O'Reilly call the, you know, the, these people? He, he's really that. And it is actually sort of nuanced and, and actually sophisticated. It, you could call it kind of a race exploitation movie because he did a lot of these kind of exploitation movies about the issue of the day, whether it was bikers or teenage you know, runaways and this kind of thing. But it's actually a really interesting look. It made in 1962 um, a look at what the actual issues were, um, you know, with the, uh, Civil Rights Act and with uh, you know integration and uh, so I feel like everything that we talk about or you guys talk about on this show comes back to this kind of uh, forced integration. You know, uh, Matt, you did uh, that great coverage of um, Democracy in Chains, and it feels like the epicenter is the uh, forcing kids to go to school with different races, and this is basically all centered around that in a really kind of interesting way. It also features a Jewish nymphomaniac. Uh, it also features uh, kind of um, liberal use of the N-word, so you can enjoy that if you're so inclined. But it, it's just really a snapshot of not just like, it's not just a documentary, but it's a snapshot of what I think Roger Corman and early 60s Hollywood thought would be sort of a moving issue for people to come to the theater to see. And for some reason, maybe because it's so sensitive and so kind of uh, 
you know, exploitative in some way. It's not that hadn't gotten a commercial release, but it is on YouTube and it sometimes plays on cable. So you can find it there. Well, uh, I will check out. I'm going to I mean, I have put all of them on. I now have a uh, to watch list on my phone. So Friends of Eddie Coyle, Scarecrow, uh, The Intruder. I am not near Negro. All of those are on my uh, list to watch. Um, and uh, Matthew, let me be the first and probably the only person to say, I'm sorry, we're going to miss you on Sunday uh, at the live uh, show. Sam, I, I appreciate that. I'm really sorry. I'm going to miss that, too. I would have loved to have been able to capture it again for posterity, but uh, it's not to be. But next year, when you do the next one, I'm sure I will be there. All right. Well, uh, Matthew Film Guy, thank you so much, buddy. Talk to you soon. My pleasure, Sam. Take care. Bye-bye. Now, we're going to try and either stream some backstage stuff on YouTube, I think, uh, and maybe even on our Instagram, which we're setting up. Have we set that up yet? It is set up, actually. Uh, the um, Majority Report? What at is, Majority FM. At Majority FM is our uh, Instagram account. Uh, there you go. Oh, oh, yeah. Look at that. Wow. Updating in wow. real time. Wow. I love it. Got about 35 follows or something. So All right. Far, we're so. going to put a link to our... Um, Jesus, you did a good job with that, uh, Matt. Um, we're gonna we're gonna build that out a little bit. Um, we might do more than this, just this picture. So yeah, stay we tuned. may do more than one picture, but we'll uh, try and do some oh. videos on there. Wow, look at that! That's oh, up the grid. yeah. Now um, <laughs> maybe what we can also do is put one of these on there. We now have our collector's item poster, which is going to be available for sale uh, at the. Uh, at the uh, the show, and uh, there it is. What do you think about that? Looks good. Can people see that? Is that, is that showing up properly? Um, Put that on the gram. Left is best. Uh, the Bell House show. Um, put that up there. That is a. Um, that's just a uh, little. Um, a one-off uh, poster. Maybe uh, maybe we'll use that uh, theme in the future. Is sure. it a limited edition poster? I think it is. Well, it necessarily is limited uh, insofar as that it's got the date of the show on there. So it's a limited edition. We, we will see. Um, and uh, we'll put that on Instagram, too. We're going to put all sorts of crazy stuff on there. Um, We're blowing up the grid. We got the uh, zero sum game uh, memes we're going to put on Instagram, and somebody did a uh, vest no vest. Did you see that? <laughs> did you see that? I don't know where I. I somebody's got to tweet that at me again, because uh, I, I think I, I lost it. Um, but uh, that's up there. So we've got all uh, all of those things, uh, wonderful things happening around here. Very exciting. Uh, folks, just want to remind you that it is your support that makes this show possible. You can become a member by going to jointhemajorityreport.com. Also, justcoffee.coop, fair trade coffee, tea, or chocolate. Use the coupon code MAJORITY. Get 10% off. Uh, check out um, uh, the Michael Brooks show. It's on uh, Michael Brooks' uh, YouTube page. Nomi Konst uh, was on this week. Um, and uh, you can go check out... Um, uh, majority.fm for a way to contribute. I think there's one more day maybe where you can uh, send a qualifying, uh, you, you can uh, donate money that will qualify for matching funds uh, in her public advocate race. She had a fundraiser uh, in, in New York City last night and uh, uh, was uh, attended by myself. I saw Michael there too. He was uh, the host of festivities. Is that what you call that? Master of Ceremonies. The impresario. The impresario. Um, and uh, Jamie, the Antifada. What's happening on the Antifada? Yeah, so this week on the Antifada. Antifada. Did I call it the Antifada? Uh, Antifada. That, that's, that's, it's all it's acceptable. Close it's close enough. Um, we have our friend Sophie Wiener of Splinter News to talk about uh, Australia. And if you were dissatisfied with uh, what Barry Weiss had to say about Australia, I strongly encourage you to listen to this instead because uh, I'd say it's, it's a slightly better, more clear-eyed outline of the political issues at play 
in that crazy country and uh, the different kinds of fascists that they have down there and the different kinds of anti-fascists that they have down there. So I found it to be a pretty interesting conversation. We also joke around a little bit about the idea of tankies for Trump because we think that's funny. Once the nation no longer needs Barry Weiss to write about, you know, the different parts of the world uh, in the paper of record, I think she should have a travel show. Um, literary oh Hangover. God. Wild on, um, Barry Weiss. Oh, gosh. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Literary Hangover. Coming up, uh, we're going to record it next week. Uh, the House of the Seven Gables by Nathaniel Hawthorne, which is a very weird book about sort of inheritance and property and decadent families. So uh, I think it, there's no sort of a modern uh, you know, relevance for it. But uh, Literary Hangover, check it out. All right, folks, going to take a quick break. Headed to the fun half, 646-257-3920 is the number. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous, you're a little bit uh, upset, you're riled up. Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. <laughs> Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> <laughs> That's some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd. Don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of spewing vitriol and hatred, you left-wing Limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grandpa. I had my first post-coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want to drive to the library. <laughs> what you're talking about is jibber jab. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> Ooh. Wow. Um, but damn, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue. If you don't like me... Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. We are back, folks. It is the fun half of uh, the Majority Report. Uh, let's go to the IMs. Producer Lauren, Happy New Year. Regarding the Shatner movie, The Intruder, it was directed back in 62 by none other than Roger Corman and co-stars Gene Cooper of the Young and Restless fame and Corbin Benson's mom. Also, Boca Raton is the hometown of actress Ariana, Ariana Grande. And if you recall, where Randy Rhodes' niece uh, Jessica went to college at Florida Atlantic University, its first, first football coach was a guy named Lou Saban. Slash the Fash. Um, oh, thank you for that. A letter carrier, posters, T-shirts. Give us the info we want, Sam. How many bushels of apples did you take out of cold storage to give out at the door? 
Uh, Winnipeg Craig, will H. John Benjamin be at the live show? There is a decent chance that H. John Benjamin will, in fact, be at the live show. Adam Cokehead, I've been s- telling Stephen Crowder that his wife's second sexual partner could be Sam Cedar if he doesn't defend his ideas like a man. <laughs> this is in reference to the article he wrote about saving his virginity for marriage. This whole, uh, this whole thing leads me to believe that she probably has buyer's remorse. Oh, is he married now? Is he married? Yeah. Oh, he is? Is it to the girl that he has read all those articles for his website? That, that always starts with, dear liberals, and it's like, no liberal is ever going to read this. It's a very interesting rhetorical Miff trick. Miff Schmechter. Uh, this week on uh, Binders of Women, my co-host, Don Maratosis, and I talk with Clara Jeffrey about why Beto has only 4% favorability ra- rating amongst four, 18 to 29-year-olds. Is it because Bernie is kidnapping and murdering children in the middle of the night? Maybe. And when will the uppity Alexandria ocasio Brotez learn to keep her place? Also, it's a friendly reminder that for every $50 donation to the show, my good friend Chewbacca will deputize you as a person of color. <laughs> oh my God. Nozini, the only thing better than listening to Sam stumbling through his first movie review in real time is Sam stumbling through his new Instagram page in real time. All the best. Grandpa Sam killing it today. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. Miami Dave should be a good president, have military experience. Uh, Should a good president have military experience to be the best commander in chief possible? Uh, No. Isn't the whole idea that the army, that the whole military has a civilian commander in chief? Yes. Um, definitionely, I, I mean, I think you, you would you, you couldn't be in the military, but but I don't know that military experience um, makes you a better um, commander in chief uh, in, in some respects. I mean, I, I, I can see I can see the argument, um, you know, uh, that maybe the right person might have a better understanding of the costs of war and might be less inclined to send uh, troops. There's certain parts of Kennedy's administration, which is like it's it's nice that he was literally like a war hero because he could speak to the Pentagon in certain ways. But also like Eisenhower is maybe the most recent example of literally a general or something doing that. And that didn't turn out very good, especially the way he I mean, he avoided overt military engagement, but this the covert stuff was just disastrous. Um I think the vast majority of our presidents have have served in the military, right? I mean, um, uh, George Bush, uh, Herbert Walker, um, and George W. Bush uh, served enough in in the military uh, to uh, go AWOL from his National Guard post. Um, So that uh, accounted for something. He was much more amenable to people who had gone AWOL. I don't know if Jimmy Carter had. I imagine he did. Um, McGovern was a bit of a war hero, I think. Um, actually, uh, he didn't win, obviously. Nixon, I presume, but I'm not sure about that, actually. Um, but uh, certainly Kennedy did. Um, and I imagine Lyndon Johnson would have, too. Uh, Nixon was in the Naval Reserve. Yeah. Uh, Carter was in the Navy. I mean, so it's uh, certainly we've we've had a lot of that. Um, it's. Those were not volunteer. Uh, well, they may have volunteered, but it was not an vol- all volunteer uh, army at that time, or I should say military at that time. So um, there'd be a different type of person who would join the military now, either A, because they did it for financial reasons and opportunities that might not be available to them in other um, areas, or that they really, really enjoyed the idea of going in and killing people. Um, I'm sure there's a third option, but I'm not sure what that is. It could be that maybe your 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 parents, you came from a long line of people who enjoy killing people, and you don't feel so excited about killing people, but you feel like a certain family tradition. So maybe those are the three types of people who join the the military. But I think. Certainly, you know, to have, uh, you know, career options and whatnot is uh, is certainly one of them. Uh, Colin from Nebraska. Crowder tweeted about no one wanted to debate him two days ago. All replies told him to debate Sam. <laughs> Crowder's subreddit is even questioning him, talking about his leaving, about leaving his mug club if he keeps dodging. His supporters Ooh. claim his health has been too poor, LOL. 
Wow, this might be the final nail in the coffin for him. Look, now I know what we're talking. Can we put this up on the screen? The um, uh, and now, and and really, let's be clear. Uh, I was surprised by this as anybody. Now, apparently, Matt, who is just incorrigible, uh, saw that uh, Stephen Crowder had uh, posted one of his things, um, one of his um, his videos. Um, the the wall is uh, bad, or you know, or it's good. We should have a wall. Yeah, still waiting for somebody to change my mind that the wall is a, a good idea. Right. So, um, and uh, apparently. Uh, Matt Leck, you know, because he's, uh, you know, he's constantly on Twitter, always trying to pick fights with people. Uh, Matt Leck um, <laughs> wrote, and this is highly inappropriate. Um, he wrote, uh, he he retweeted with a comment, have Sam Cedar on my bitch. And, um, the, and then after that, uh, things went sort of, haywire for uh for for that tweet it seemed like every single reply said some version iteration what what like what, let's look at the ratio here he had wow. 1001 uh replies <laughs> and 176 uh retweets that's that healthy quite the ratio he almost has more replies than likes even I bet you a bunch of people that liked it were like people from our side too, who just wanted to see all the replies. Yeah, let's monitor this in a couple hours. And um, th- there's been over a thousand replies, and then like uh, two days later, someone emailed and said, "You should check this out," because I had no idea. And I went and looked at it. And I was like, "Oh my god, there's a lot of people out there who really uh, want to dog uh, Stephen Crowder." Oh yeah, a friend of mine who does not listen to the show at all just texted me a meme yesterday that someone made of Steven Crowder that says, uh, Steven Crowder is afraid to debate Sam Cedar. Change <laughs> my, my mind. mind. I saw that too. We should put that on. That's we gonna, should put that on. on that, there should be a lot of Instagram stuff on, uh, the, on that. And um, so he, I would imagine, um, is, is aware uh, of this. And if it's in his subreddit uh, too, that's got to be uh, tough. And, uh, and so... Um, it's still the best thing is that video that somebody made. I can't remember where the blue flame is coming out of my eyes. Oh yeah. Um, but let me just say this. Um, I understand that, uh, that Steven's in poor health. I, I, I'm sort of shocked about how, uh, how he's able to go out and about on the town to do these videos in such poor health. Um, and I will make it super easy um, we can do this uh, via Skype or, or, the, or the phone, or um, we can do it in any way that is uh, comfortable for, for Stephen. Um, if he would feel more comfortable me going to his studio, I know it's in Texas, I think, right? Uh, doesn't he live in Austin? I, 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 will, uh, I will fly to Austin uh, on, my, on my own dime uh, at this point. Um, <laughs> Right. I mean, I yeah, whatever, whatever would make it uh, most comfortable and less stressful for Stephen, I am willing to do. I just um, he keeps I mean, this is what's very, so, you know, uh, people are like, why is this so important to you? Well, it's not it's not that that important to me. But he keeps claiming that no one from the left will debate him on this stuff. And he keeps saying, change my mind. And I'm saying, well, give me an opportunity to change your mind. Um, but, but you won't do it. So we're, I don't, it's, we're bringing our ideas to the marketplace. Yeah. I'm just, and, and he, he, what he's doing is he's saying the marketplace is closed again. I'm sorry. We had a water main leak. And then the next day you show up and it's like, oh, well, no, the marketplace has to be closed because we couldn't find the guy who had the key to the chain across the parking lot. And so we have to close it. And every day he seems to have a different excuse. Maybe we should try dressing ourselves up in disguises like um, easily owned college kids and then see if he wants to talk to us. Yeah, yeah maybe that would be it. We need to look like a college kid that's late for another class. And right, exactly. Read up on the topic he's talking about. Yeah, that, that, could, that, could, that could work. I mean, and I would also say, look, now listen, I know... Um, there are people who work on his show and people work uh, affiliated with it in many ways. And uh, if you ever want to give us a heads up as to uh, when he is, um, uh, when 
that's the uh, that's the video where you know where, if he's out and about i mean i don't know that i would want to uh fly uh somewhere uh without uh real uh evidence that he was going to be there but um if that happens i mean it could be worth you know just a visit a sit down going to like louisville yeah university i mean um meanwhile the uh, shutdown is getting uh, a little bit hairier for uh, the Republicans. Again, we have that list of uh, Republicans who uh, anticipate uh, having some problems with it. And I, I would imagine um, there's a reason why this is happening in Atlanta, um, because you've got um, David Perdue, who I believe is up for re-election in 2020. And he is in Georgia, which is a uh, got a partisan uh, index um, of R5. He won by uh, he had 53 percent of the vote in the last election. Now. That was six years ago. Or it will have been six years and every two or three years um, when we see these elections, there, there's trends. Georgia is pushing towards blue and in a potential wave election which it could be in 2020. We don't know yet. A guy like uh, Purdue is going to be awful nervous. And it is the Republican Party that is standing in the way of the government being restarted. Period. End of story. And uh, in Georgia, here are TSA workers who are forced to work um, for no pay. And I think around now is when they should have been getting their check for the past two weeks, and they will not get it. There are reports of TSA workers calling in sick. There are reports of TSA workers basically saying, quitting, going to get a different job. It's not like this is the best job in the world anyways. And we have a, um, a terminal in the uh, Miami airport, which is being closed, I guess, theoretically, temporarily because they don't have TSA workers, people around the country are going to start to feel this more and more, even if they don't think they, that it impacts them, they're going to start to realize it does. Here is a clip of that protest in uh, Atlanta. There you go. Uh, so those are TSA workers in Georgia, and this is going to put pressure on a guy like David Perdue, and it's going to put pressure on the other Republican senators because that's where this whole game is. At one point, they got to go down to Mitch McConnell and say, uh, Mitch, you're going to screw me over in my election, and I know that you're afraid that you're going to get screwed over in your election if you have this vote, but we can't all live in states where, you know, Donald Trump has uh, above 50% approval rating. In fact, most of us don't. So uh, that's the problem that the Republicans are, are facing there. Um, here is uh, Lou Dobbs and, and Jason Chaffetz. Now, what is he doing these days? He's on Fox. <laughs> oh, is he a Fox News contributor? Yeah, he uh, resigned from the House before his term was up. He resigned uh, from the House before his term was up to get a job on uh, on Fox News. And uh, here he is. Remember this guy was like, I can't vote. I can't look at my kids. Wasn't he the one who said, I can't look at my kids and vote for Donald Trump? Didn't he say that? And um, so uh, here he is, uh, Jason Chaffetz, uh, Fox News, talking to Lou Dobbs. And uh, Lou Dobbs has a real issue, apparently, with the, uh, the two-party system. Good to hear him <laughs> speaking up. He'd, just, he'd rather go to a one, a one party. The president uh, has the ability to do this. I, I don't think there's, there shouldn't be mm -hmm. uh, too much legal yeah. question. That doesn't mean that the Democrats won't Positive. challenge. Um, there's a tremendous amount of legal question as to whether the um, president has the ability to just randomly call for a state of emergency. However, I appreciate... Uh, Lou Dobbs making this point moot so that when uh, President um, uh, uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez says that uh, for the sake of the health of uh, the American people, we need to uh, both 
create a single payer healthcare system and also nationalize the um, the oil refineries. Um, that Lou will appreciate that she has every right and ability to do so. Um, but let's go forward. That doesn't mean that the Democrats won't challenge and try to obstruct as they have throughout right. his presidency. Uh, but I really believe that the, the way forward here is for him to declare a national emergency uh, and simply uh, sweep aside uh, a, uh, the, the recalcitrant uh, left in this country. Uh, they, have, they have obstructed, resisted, uh, and subverted for far too long. Uh, the American people don't need to put up with this, and the president needs to find a way forward here where he can deliver on this promise in advance of the 2020 presidential election. Uh, because that means he will have fulfilled all of his major promises to the American people from the 2016 election. I think it's critically important. I, I think the president will prevail if he does it tonight or tomorrow or whatever it is. I will wholeheartedly support him. I do think they can need to continue the daily drumbeat uh, and make the case um, rather than have everybody say, oh, well, it's tied up in the courts. And, you know, in the coming months, we'll go ahead and see what happens. I don't want to give the Democrats that excuse. I um, it will be tied up in the courts and not just by... Um not just by Democrats, but by landowners in Texas who don't want to give up their <laughs> property for the sake of Donald Trump's pretend wall. Uh, but Chaffetz was the guy who re withdrew his endorsement of Donald Trump because he couldn't look at his daughter in the eye. Apparently, uh, his daughter, um, he somehow maybe he just doesn't look at his daughter anymore. Or maybe she doesn't you know, talk to him anymore. What was the thing that he was mad at Trump about? Uh, I think that was after the uh, grab him by the um, the uh, uh, the private part uh, comment. Yeah, so women are people, but immigrants, not so much. Not so much. There's a genuine split in conservative media on this, though, because Ben Shapiro talk was talking about yesterday how it would be really dumb for Trump to call. Like, Trump, Trump's just going to call for a national emergency if he wants to uh, have a momentary victory and just be able to blame the courts later, which is probably true. Um and there's other you have other people like Dobbs that just saying, yeah, go for it. Maybe because they, they want that to happen. Well, I, I think Shapiro is afraid of the precedent that it will set. And because, look, th it, it will set a precedent. It will set a precedent. I mean, he will be he will not build this wall. The wall will not get built. Particularly this way. Like, you know, the five billion dollars that would get earmarked for it, it would, you know, they would start the construction maybe or the process. But in this instance, not a dollar will be expended because it will be tied up in courts immediately. And the question will never be resolved because it will still be in courts if the next, pre you know, unless uh, uh, Trump uh, wins re-election. And then the next president will have a precedent to call for a national emergency at any time. And it may be for stuff. Now, there'll be lawsuits uh, questioning that that one. But um, here, is, uh, here is Representative Mo Brooks, who, um, who is already worried about the precedent that could be set. Because look, if you're gonna argue that a phenomena like people crossing the border, uh, the southern border, right? Not the northern border, just the southern border is problematic with no data to support this. Like, how could it be a crisis now and it hasn't been a crisis for years? How could there be a state of emergency now and there hasn't been one for years? And you're, like I say, you're opening yourself up to uh, a lot of new presidents because, you know, uh, President uh, Sanders or Warren or Biden or uh, O'Rourke could say, we have a real crisis and that is um, climate change. And we actually have data that suggests that, not that the number of people coming across the border is less than it was. We have uh, rising sea temperatures faster than, than were earlier predicted.
just that's a story today. And uh, Representative Mo Brooks, he seems to get like where this could be headed. And that is the problem. Judgment where we should not be going into Syria for the purpose so, of regime so change, which second. was the stated purpose of Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama at various but times. But you're talking about Syria now. Issuing work permits to I, I illegal aliens you're, you're, in the United States talking, of America when the statute clearly says you can't do it. Let, let me let me go back to this matter of national security right now and the president's determination of what is an emergency or not. Say, say five years from now, there's a hurricane, a, a vast hurricane, and there's a Democratic president who believes that climate change was involved with the hurricane. Thousands of people die from it. Could that president, he or she, then say he needs a national emergency declaration to get money to fight that? I'm sorry, you'd have, that was kind of convoluted the way I heard it. Well, you uh, say the it. fact of the matter is that the whole <laughs> argument is convoluted for a National Emergency Act for wall funding also. What I'm saying is if a president can make the claim that national security money, emergency money is needed for a wall, could a president at one point say it's needed to fight climate change? I would have to look at the specific statutes oh. to see what you can and cannot do. That is so far out there. Why? That if it's a matter of national security, if it's a matter of national, if it is a matter of national security, and the president deems it so, why is it outside I'm the sorry. purview of the law? I don't see how that example that you gave affects the national security of the United States of America. The Pentagon and the intelligence we're, we're services often about talk about the effect of climate in, change. In, I'm making a hypothetical in argument this instance, here. But... In this instance, we're talking about protecting the southern border. Mm -hmm. Any nation to exist has borders. And the primary mm -hmm. function of a nation with respect those, to those borders is to secure them. So that is a matter of national okay. security by definition. Most... Uh, just... Uh... For instance, U.S. News, August 1st, 2017, national security and defense officials are recognizing climate change as a threat it is. Uh, this has been going on actually for years before this, but uh, the military has been listing climate change as an increasing national security threat. In fact, I think it's like close to number one. And the, the best is watching Mo Brooks is like, eyes shoot up into the back of his head where he's like oh god how did we not prepare for this question i mean he's genuinely stumped i mean so in some respect look I, there is value here to set this precedent because it's like the filibuster well president bernie sanders could very well say we have a climate change national security i am taking money one third, one quarter of the military budget, one half, three quarters. And we're going to fight climate change with that. And there's nothing you can do based upon the, the Trump precedent, the Republican precedent. I totally have the right. It'd be even cooler if I thought the Democrats would ever do that. Well, yes. I mean, who knows? Um, the, again, there would be lawsuits and whatnot, but... Um, it would be cooler. It would be great. I don't know that Donald Trump is going to do uh, what he's going to do either, but um, fun to watch Congressman Mo Brooks, like, all of a sudden, in real time, realize, like, oh, oh, oh boy, I left the paddle. Uh, I left the paddle in the truck. I'm up the creek now. I've got a real problem. Uh, meanwhile, for whatever reason, what, what is it that it, oh, it was the New York Times piece, right? That um, was it. The New York Times did a um, did a story on Steve King. Um, he was interviewed by the New York Times, and he said, um, "When did the words white nationalist, white supremacist, and Western civilization become offensive?" Which is. Um, a weird thing to say. I mean, the words themselves are not considered offensive. You can say the words and people won't be offended. We use them all often. the time. Uh, that's um, white supremacy, for instance. And I don't, I don't ever feel necessary to say to uh, people, you know, listen, if you have kids listening, don't want them to hear this word. Um, the issue is that uh, white supremacy is offensive. Um, well, you're saying white supremacy like it's a bad thing. Well, the, yeah, exactly. And that's what his uh, issue was. Um, now, for 
years. Years. Stephen King has been an unapologetic um, white supremacist, racist, and it just seems like now uh, folks on the right are starting to notice it. Like, it's really more like, look, we got no problem with it, but dude, your fly is show open. Like, you know, keep it, keep it in your pants. Um, here is just an example of Stephen King on, uh, Steve King, I should say, on uh, Tucker Carlson. Another person is very concerned about the White family. Congressman Steve King of Iowa recently started a debate here in this country when he tweeted in support of Wilders. He wrote this, Wilders understands that culture and demographics are our destiny. We can't restore our civilization with someone else's babies. And so we're at this place now in America where we're seeing people marching in the streets that are pushing back against the American culture and the American civilization. And it's troubling Pause to me. It. What is the American civilization? Um, with other people's babies. I mean, he's really, he's talking about white people, right? I mean, I think we know that. And, and, and after all, according to him, what's, what's, what's offensive about white supremacy? And it's troubling to me that over the last 25 years, we've essentially phased out the, the promotion of assimilation, and we promoted instead multiculturalism Tucker and diversity knows. as if it were our strength. And in fact, they're using it now to divide us, and that's what Barack Obama did throughout his presidency. Uh, everything you said, I, I think, is defensible and probably right. And that's what we've got to restore is Western civilization for the world, Tucker. But Positive. we, we got to restore Western civilization for the world. Yeah. Gives the Eastern, that's very sweet. Give the Eastern civilization some of this Western civilization. That's right. Yeah. We've got to we've 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 got to make. I mean, that's eliminationist talk, it seems to me. But go ahead. But the College Park, Maryland, is uh, the language that I saw come down. says, we don't care whether you're legal or illegal. We don't care whether you are a deportable. We just want you to weigh in and voice your opinion on our local election. And uh, that it so devalues citizenship, and it devalues being a good citizen, and it has contempt for the law and the rule of law. And we're going to defend, descend into a third world country if we're going to tolerate such a thing. So this is one of those stories. College Park, Maryland is a pretty small place. There's University of Maryland's there. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, but it doesn't seem like a national story, except when I saw it, I thought, this is the future. If there's one thing oh, the president ran on, I watched it, it was building the wall. We're going to build the mm -hmm. wall, a big, beautiful wall. This campaign was not run on, I don't know, cutting Medicaid. It just, it just wasn't. So why, ha your truth teller, tell us why it hasn't happened. The, 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 the wall itself. Yeah, and why, it, it, why hasn't the Congress moved, separate from everything else, to fund and build the wall that their leader, the president, promised repeatedly during the campaign. All Democrats oppose it. As I don't know a Democrat that opposes illegal immigration today. And you saw a Democrat candidate for president, Hillary Clinton, say, we're going to fast track them to citizenship. Well, and, and as College Park is the, is the future. Congressman, thank you. That's what happens to America. Let's restore the rule of law, Tucker. Thanks. Amen. Yes. Wow. Good for Tucker, giving, uh, you know, just allowing for that exchange of ideas. Um, we're going to talk uh, more about uh, Tucker Carlson at the um, at the uh, Sunday show. Uh, talk about his um, his critique of capitalism. Um, the critique was um, was 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 correct in some respects. Um, funny that it only becomes a uh, critique when it starts to impact white people uh, in his mind, but uh, that may be just a coincidence. He's definitely someone to be afraid of. Yeah. Like the far right parties in Europe have done a much more effective job for historical reasons of pairing this kind of uh, right wing populism with a sort of social democracy for the right people. And that combination would be unstoppable. I mean, it already was unstoppable in Trump and his uh, nods to social democracy were mainly rhetorical. So Look out for that guy. I mean, this there is history in this country of that uh, of that type of talk. Um, Pat Buchanan was not terribly far from that stuff too. Um, so it, it's not without precedent in this country. Um, but it is uh, interesting and uh, important to uh, discuss. Um, but you know, again, Tucker uh, shows a little too much uh, leg insofar as uh, having. Uh, Steve King on. They didn't so mention times. it. Uh, apparently, it didn't come up on Fox News. The whole Steve King comments, even though they were quite uh, concerned about Rashida Tlaib's language. That's really weird. That's really weird. Huh. 
Um, this was a fun clip. It'd be nice if we had a little bit more of this in the United States, right? But we never have, like, there's never an opportunity for, for something like this. Um, I also like their sets better. I, I love uh, British political television. But uh, here is, uh, this is on uh, Question Time. It is um, a, a BBC um, a BBC news panel show, I guess. And I guess they take questions from the audience, which is also great. I mean, we do that here, too. Um, but uh, Somebody should pay us to make this in America. Good idea. Here it is. Two things. Uh, firstly, could we get over feeling sorry for Theresa May? Um, <laughs> it's, do you never it's, feel sorry for her? It's, it's not. Hang, hang on, hang on. Do you never feel sorry for her? No, I don't feel sorry for her. She's the woman who, for many, many years, has led uh, the hostile environment uh, for migrants in this country, which resulted in the Windrush generation. It's a disgrace. She's the person who created her very specific red lines on immigration and the ECJ, which have created the negotiation mess that we're in. She triggered Article 50 when she had no plan. And as to criticizing the EU on this, there are 27 other countries in the EU. They have been completely united on this. We do not even have a cabinet that can unite, and definitely a government that isn't in control of the process. They are a body of rules and regulations, and they are not going to break that when it's the most successful um, single market in the world, and, and all around the world people want to do deals with the EU. We are going to lose all of that, and it is ridiculous for us, with our hopeless government, who cannot get it together, to actually work out what the will of the people is today, in 2019, um, to blame the EU and to go around feeling sorry for Theresa May. I'm sorry. I mean, broadly speaking, I don't think we should feel sorry for many politicians, period, ever. And so I like that sentiment. Um, and it just the idea of, of anybody asking like a two-parter question uh, from the audience here like, would be completely unheard of. Well, there's Ken Bone, and that almost unleashed a revolution. Remember him. Who was Ken Bone again? Though? He was this guy in like a red uh, sweater that got to ask a question. He was like a fossil fuel guy or like worker or something like that. But I don't know. He he turned out. Yeah, didn't we find some like. He was like the one independent that hadn't tweets. decided between Hillary and Trump. Uh, like, yeah. yeah. Prime Minister Corbyn grows closer by the day, folks. So that's exciting. Um. So here is, uh, you know, and we're going to be doing a lot of this, folks. Uh, the, the parade of, um, of will-be, would-be uh, candidates uh, showing up on various TV shows. And, um, I, you know, I don't, it, maybe it's a little bit unfair to judge people in the context of these type of shows. But, you know, if you have a message and you have an access to, uh, let's say, going on uh, Colbert's show, the, you know, the, the, the late night show on CBS, um, you know, make it one that, uh, you know, make it count. Here is uh, Kamala Harris. And, you know, I think we've spoken about uh, Kamala Harris, you know, uh, some of the reservations that we've had uh, on this show. Uh, her, her track record in, in the prosecution of Steve Mnuchin uh, is quite, quite bad. People should uh, Google into uh, that. Um, I followed a lot of the stuff that she was doing during the um, in the wake of the foreclosure crisis. And uh, she and uh, Bo Biden and uh, Schneiderman uh, in uh, New York State made a, uh, um, a bit of a show about uh, holding the banks uh, accountable because the federal government was not. Uh, Schneiderman, frankly, was the worst of them. In terms of uh, going on television, I remember this distinctly. Um, after this committee was set up, joining the committee, people feeling like that was a, a bit of a sellout. But he went on to uh, Chris Hayes' show, I think it was in the morning at that time, and said, you know, six months, we haven't brought prosecutions. Hold me to that. And, of course, uh, no one did. And um, he didn't do any of that. And it was a uh, just a big cover. But... Uh, let's give her a chance. Here she is, Kamala Harris, on uh, Stephen Colbert's show. All right. Well, you look, as I said, you look so happy on the cover. 
What, what makes you happy? Where does your hope come from? I remain optimistic. Um, the way that I think about it is that we, we are a country that was founded on noble ideals. And we all know we have not yet reached those ideals, but part of our strength is we fight to reach those ideals. We are an aspirational country. And if at the moment that we lose this aspiration to be all that our founders said we should and can be, that's a bad moment. But I remain optimistic that this is worth fighting for. Our country is worth fighting for. And, and these ideals are worth fighting for. And if something is worth fighting for, then it's a fight worth having. It's a fight worth having. Period. Period. Wait a second. What was that? If something's worth fighting for, then it's a fight worth having? Is that what she said? It makes you think. She's so good at this. Um, I mean, I don't know. I mean, that was, you know, she... She was composed. <laughs> I mean, I, you know, I, the, the question itself wasn't terribly, um, you know, uh, serving up, uh, you know, tell us what you're really going to do. But it was all, I mean, here's the thing, is that in the course of the primary, I think the opportunity for candidates to, you know, I can understand you're going on uh, on, on a CBS, you know, you know, late night show. You're not in the political realm. There's going to become a point where think people are going to have to get more specific. And in the context of the Democratic primary, it's going to be um, a fairly unique opportunity in um, really in the past, like 20 or 30 years, as far as I can remember, about. Um, in 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 really examining uh the democratic uh field because there is no um there does not seem to be any at least even establishment or conventional wisdom consensus as to who would be the strongest candidate right um in this election obviously bernie and uh, joe biden pull the best of those two, and, and sometimes uh, Biden's up, sometimes Bernie's up. Um, but there doesn't seem to be a conventional wisdom thrust like there was, say, like with, with John Kerry. And there doesn't seem to be, um, you know, and this is going to be a very big field. In 2008, going into 2008, early on, like in 2006, people were convinced it was going to be Hillary Clinton. Um, and then it was just between Clinton. It was between the three, John Edwards and, and Clinton and Obama. And I don't even know how many people really thought Edward, Edwards. But th that was from like day one. There was a couple other candidates, but nobody. This field is about wide open as I think I've seen, you know, as certainly as an adult. And um, there's always, you know, an urgency, right, to uh, that we have to win. But there's never been a time where the candidate, uh, where a candidate who was chosen uh, because we have to win, you know, in my estimation, won. I mean, I don't, you know, John Kerry was the candidate because we have to win. Yeah. Nixon won yeah. two elections. Well, it um, seems like that argument is often brandished by centrist liberals in order to put well, down left challengers. It's it's brandished by everybody. Uh, I, I mean, I mean, it's it, you know, everybody. Uh, he, he, the the a candidate who is chosen because they are going to win is not is it, not an effective way of choosing a winning candidate. Just hasn't been the case. Or because you think they're going to win, or you say you think they're going to win, right? I, I mean, yeah. Um, I think the idea is you choose a candidate based upon their strengths. You see how they do in the primary. But, you know, like the argument that you got to choose uh, the person who you think is going to win, I mean, that's nice. But in practice, I, mean, I would love to know the example of when that worked. I don't think people were like, Bill Clinton. When Bill Clinton won, I don't think there was a sense of like, Bill Clinton's the only person who can beat George uh, Herbert Walker Bush. He didn't even get over 50% uh, in that election. I don't know. I think Nathan Robinson wrote a very convincing case for why Bernie Sanders is the most electable candidate in current affairs. Well, yes, you may have, you may be predisposed to that argument. And I think that, you know, that's, that's fine. But um, I just don't think it's a compelling argument 
frankly, just in general about anybody that this is the one who's going to beat Donald Trump. The one who's going to beat Donald Trump is the one that people get uh, excited about because they're excited about the politician. Um, not, I mean, people certainly weren't like Barack Obama is going to beat John McCain. They, that wasn't like, you know, there was no sense of like, we have to go with Obama as opposed to Clinton because he's the one who's going to win. It was just that the people were excited about Obama. Um, it's weird that I kind of disagree with you on this. That is not weird to me that you would uh, disagree with me. But what, what? Well, like normally you care way more than I do about whether or not the Democrats win, right? Oh, I, 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 it, I'm, I definitely want them to win. I definitely want them to win. So why I'm is just that a, not a good argument for who should be the nominee? Because it's not a good way to choose in terms of who you think is going to win because you're rarely right about that. That's what I'm saying. Is that like it is like uh, the only analogy I can give is it's like playing defensively in in sports. It just exposes your priors. Yeah, it's just it's just you're you're not actually going to where the energy is. You're trying to guess what other people uh, are excited about. And uh, very often that is a mistake. Um, I, 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 my point is I haven't seen it work. Well, given that we can't tell who's the most electable, I guess, then it should default to, you know, whose politics you agree with the most. So in that way, I guess it could have a good outcome. Yeah. Even though I still think electability, I don't know, they threw that argument at us. Maybe I'm just being petty and throwing it back at them. Yeah, I think possibly. <laughs> I mean, I, I just don't think it's a good argument when they make it. I don't think it's a good argument um, uh, <laughs> when, when uh, we make it because people don't know. I think people shift too easily from Bernie would have won to only Bernie would have won, personally. That's, you know, I, I've always been a uh, Martin O'Malley would have won guy. Uh, <coughs> I think there were very, very unique uh, circumstances when that, that caused um, uh, Donald Trump to win, that there was uh, a, literally a dozen different things that would have changed the outcome of that election. Small things, very small things, uh, to, to larger ones. Um, so we'll see. Uh, let's go to the phones. Calling from a 240 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Sam, is that you? Yes, it is me. Who is this? Hey, it's Vito from Maryland. How's it going? It's going well. Hi, Vito. What's on your mind? So, um, well, first of all, here in Maryland, uh, we have uh, successfully pretty much gerrymandered the... Uh, Republicans out of existence here. I think there's like one left now. And uh, well, that case is actually going uh, to the Supreme Court. Yeah, um, we'd actually get rid of this last one too, except that it's they just can't figure out a way to like. Uh, he's over there, I think, on the eastern shore somewhere, where it's like, you know, it's there's if they could, they'd get rid of him too. But but I, I you know, the one thing I would add is that it's it's not exactly the same. I mean, it is gerrymandering. There's no doubt about it. Um, but I mean, the legislature here is like overwhelmingly democratic. And the, I mean, this state is a democratic state. It's not like Wisconsin or Ohio where, you know, the, the opposition party gets the majority of the vote and they still get screwed out of, right. Right. Out of, uh, so it's, it's not, it's not to that type of a, of a thing. Um, but, um, I wanted to ask you one other thing and that is I, I recently saw Nancy Pelosi, um, and she was asked about health care and she, she, she made some sort of distinction between, or she brought up the fact that, you know, historically over the years, she's always been in favor of, uh, single payer health care, but not necessarily Medicare for all. And I'm wondering if you know what she's talking about or what type of single payer health care she's referring to, because I, I can't figure out. I I, I, yeah, without about. knowing the quote, I can't I, I can't tell. You. I mean, sometimes you uh, and I appreciate the call, Vito. Sometimes you hear people say, like, you know, I want universal access or I want universal health care is different from Medicare for all. Or um, I mean, because theoretically, the Affordable Care Act was supposed to provide universal or near universal health care. Um, and. 
providing access is um, is a slippery word in the first place because, like you know, uh, we all have access to um, you know those uh, sweet uh, you know the Teslas, the top Tesla or whatever the name of that Tesla car is. We all have access to it. You just need to get the seventy thousand or what hundred thousand dollar, whatever it is. You just need to get that money and be able to spend it on a car. Um, and so in that sense, we all have access to it, right? No one's prevented from buying it because apparently, you know, like in our society, um, the concept of money being a, uh, coercive in some, uh, respects or money being, um, a sort of almost like a natural phenomena, right? Nobody is, nobody is barred from being a uh, top athlete. It's just uh, nature. It's as if like money is just something like natural. You either have it or you don't, but nobody's barring you based upon, you know. It, uh... So the idea is you, when we say Medicare for all, and even the different, there's different Medicare for all programs, but the idea is that what we want is low to no cost health insurance With no copays and be able to go to any doctor with it. Yeah, it's free at the point of service. Exactly. And um, I don't want to be filing things. I mean, look, if there was like $50 per family, you know, $50 a month per family, and I would never have to file something or whatever it is. Uh, you know, I would be, you know, okay with that. It seems silly because why do you want to have even a situation where you have to take it? Like, why not just charge me that on my taxes? Cause you already have the IRS there. Why build another apparatus to take in my money for health insurance? Um, so the easiest way to do it is just simply tax on one end, provide services on the other. That's why I like the idea of means testing social security is so stupid. Because you can means test the Social Security. We do that already, but you could do it more. And that is you tax wealthy people more. And we know who that $50 requirement would hurt the most. Well, I, you know, you'd want it means tested, but then you need, an, you need, then you need a whole other apparatus to determine whether or not I, I qualify for the $50 payment or not. I mean, it's absurd. It's silly. We have, we have a means testing for all programs in this country. And that is called taxes. Progressive taxation provides you all the means testing you need for anything. Rich people will not be sending their kids. We will not be paying for rich people to send their kids to the free public uh, uh, university in each state. Rich people will be because they'll be taxed more. So just, you know, that those are the principles that are really important to keep in mind. Call from a 717 area code. Who's this? Hi, this is Danny from PA. Danny from PA. What's on your mind? Uh, can I first get a uh, 18th birthday horn playing? This is birthday horn. Well done. You have reached uh, the, the chai, the, I think it is. Uh, that is the chai. Uh, the voting age, too. Yeah, voting age, too. Which means I'm no longer, you're, which means you're no longer allowed to yell at me for not voting. Well, there you go. Uh, well, I am now I'm yeah. allowed to vote, yell at you for not voting if you don't vote. Before, you, uh, yeah. you, didn't, you didn't have the ability to. Well, yeah, I'm going to make sure to vote Libertarian and Green Party every single time. <laughs> well, Break the two-party establishment, man. All right, well, uh, click. <laughs> no, uh, I wanted to call in uh, to talk about a case that happened in the Philippines with one of my friends because it's really interesting about something that Duterte has been doing recently. Okay. Um, my friend has an uncle who lives in the Philippines uh, and works for the Philippine government. Originally, he worked in counterintelligence or counterinsurgency because uh, specifically, he was tasked to uh, combat the New People's Army in the Philippines, for which he was almost assassinated. Right. But ever since then, he's now working uh, with the Philippine police 
uh, for the drug war. Really? So <laughs> recently a scandal uh, broke, broke out in the Philippines revolving around uh, police and drug money, and it, it, it's insane. Like it's supposed to be this huge scandal, but um, it turns out that my friend's uncle is literally at the center of this case, but he isn't actually accused of having anything to do with the money laundering, drug money, anything. He, <laughs> what is likely to have happened is that as the mili- the military assassinate a shot about five or so police officers uh, because they thought that they were terrorists. And when the government came to him and said, Hey, you got to cover this up. He just said to them, no, we're not doing that ever. And ever since then, all the people that have been involved in the not cover up are now at the center of this scandal. Hey. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, bad. Yeah. Uh, Duterte is now throwing it, trumped up charges at uh, him, numerous people, and, well. Well, it's uh, uh, interesting and, frankly, uh, sad story, uh, Danny. And, you know, look, this is uh, certainly... <laughs> There's not going to be any criticism coming from the United States in that regard uh, whatsoever. Oh, God. No. no. Uh, ugly stuff. You still have... Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I appreciate the call, man. All right. I'll see you. All right. It sucks for the Maoists, too, because they made a deal with Duterte, and he thought they thought that he was willing to negotiate peace with them, and now he's just slaughtering them Horrible. en masse. Oh, I found the Nancy Pelosi Co- quote, if you want to hear oh, it. Hold on one second. Call him from a 347 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Give it to me after. Uh, hello? Hello? Uh, hello. Um, and, uh, I, is, is, is Michael there? Because you guys have been talking a lot of shit about me. I mean, Dave Rubin. I'm, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> how are you guys doing? I just wanted to talk to you about um, AOC real quick. Who is this? Uh, where are you I calling from? Like a, Who is it? Where are you calling Oh, from? my name is Sam, and I'm from New York. Uh, Manhattan, to be specific. All right. Um, I just want to call because a um, uh, short background about me. About like nine years ago, I was in a car accident, and unfortunately, I broke my neck and I was left paralyzed from the sternum down. Um, and before my accident, I was kind of a conservative but a social um, liberal. And then when I didn't have, you know, I was fairly well off. I had, you know, great job. I had plenty of cash. Um, but my accident left me, uh, I was living in Puerto Rico at the time and my accident really, uh, screwed me over and the Puerto Rico, the Puerto Rico, uh, health system or medical uh, system is, is abysmal. And so I had to, uh, move from Puerto Rico and come to New York. Uh, and when I got here, I was broke. I had no money. I, uh, was put, I had to wait for Medicaid to accept me and I had to, uh, uh, go into a rehab. And after that, I didn't have anywhere to live. So I had to be put into a nursing home. So with, throughout this whole process, I was seeing how someone getting, getting, uh, injured or so, something so traumatic happening to them, how the system really just doesn't give a fuck about them. Uh, they'll put them through hell and they don't have a voice and they have you living with, you know, a bunch of old people that, um, no offense to them, but you just don't belong there. And uh, thanks to the New York City, I was able to get a subsidy that's given through the VNA, which is called the um, Nursing Home Transition uh, uh, Waiver. And I, I'm ba- it's basically hands by sexual, Section 8. And uh, my disability payment, well, they only take 30% out of it. And I get an apartment. And that was just a two-year battle just to find an apartment that would accept me. But anyway, going back to AOC, I find myself leaning very progressive now because I'm seeing how these individuals are like me because I've met so many are just messed up by the system but I still am on the fence on this hardcore progressive taxing system and I was just wondering uh, how do you see how that would benefit me in in, in the long run well 
how will it benefit? It wouldn't benefit just you. It would benefit all of society. I mean, oh no, yeah, definitely. No, no, I'm not just saying just me. I'm saying like people like me and basically the whole, the whole, uh, the, the whole population. But I just meant like, what would be the is this whole talking point of people being less productive and the economy collapsing? Is this something that that should be worried about? Well, I, all I can tell you is that uh, in the 1950s. And through the mid, uh, the early 1960s, the top tax, uh, top marginal tax rate was 90%. It's 90%. It's 90%. So if you made, yeah. and I believe it was around four hundred, four hundred fifty thousand dollars at the time, which I believe in today's dollars would be about $3 million. That yeah, dollar that you would make over $3 million, you would get 10 yeah. cents of. And yeah. that period, time period, for a whole host of reasons, and it's not perfectly analogous, um, was what they called the Great Compression, where uh, we had um, a lot of economic growth, but it was shared more broadly than in any other time in our country. And, um, yeah. and so all that that shows is that the having a top marginal tax rate like that does not inhibit uh, economic growth. Does it necessarily guarantee it? I, I don't know. I don't know that there, you could make that argument. Maybe you could. Maybe that's just correlation. But what it does clearly show is it does not inhibit the ability of the economy uh, to do well in that do, respect. Do you, think that we should, do you think that we should also be tackling the, the capital gains tax? Absolutely. In fact, at that time, they were not um, they were not taxed at such disparate rates. I don't even know if they were if there was the capital gains tax was what constitute capital gains was the same at this time. I mean, this would be one. Because these people are these people are just these people are just hoarding money and putting them in. That's exactly in, uh, right. You know, overseas. That's banks exactly and, right. And just, that money know. is not productive at all. That money is not productive yeah. at all. I mean, uh, and there's so many there's so many loopholes for them to get away around that. I, well, of course. I, 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 that's but, why I really I laugh at tax reform because we do a tax reform and then. There's another loophole within a loophole within a loophole. It's like it's always being exploited. That's right. And, and obviously, you know, like, um, w you know, what uh, what Kennedy did and then what um, um, uh, Reagan did, Kennedy dropped that top uh, marginal tax rate from 90 percent to 75 percent. Um, and, uh, ostensibly, and we went to, and we went to the moon and shit like that back then. You right, know, we did some right. really incredible shit. Yeah. And, <laughs> and, and, and it's listen. There, there's arguments as to whether you need to tax to spend. There are, you know, there's a good piece on MMT by um, uh, Josh Barrow, actually, uh, in the um, uh, New York Magazine. It, it gets a little weedy. Under MMT, you need to tax really to sort of just maintain, uh, just keep the economy from overheating for there being too much demand for a specific product. Um, but, mm -hmm. and, and, and but regardless, the, the bottom line is um, what you don't want is this incredible wealth disparity. It is destabilizing yeah, yeah. for society yeah. for a myriad of reasons. Um, and, and, and that's at the very least, it will it will achieve that. And I'm not convinced, frankly, you don't you don't do a, maybe a one time or, you know, wealth tax, too. Uh, yeah. Maybe it's not one time, but I'm not sure. But I, I, I think it's n it, it is unhealthy for society to have people. It, it damages the social fabric. Definitely. Totally. Yeah. All right. Well, Sam, uh, yeah. you know, uh, I, I, my heart goes out to you uh, for uh, the sort of oh, the, no, the, hey, the struggles you've been I, through. I know, a, I know a lot of people that are way worse off than me. I can, I can do, I can do plenty of stuff still. Obviously, it was a big adjustment, but. There are people that are way worse off than me. I know people that are 20 something years old and they've been in nursing homes for 10 years and the only thing they can do is lift up their finger. Um, I just would like to see a, a government that would work for, 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 for the, their most vulnerable. And it's, it's a damn shame that a tragedy in, in your life, uh, even though you try your best to get out of it, you're still held down by a system that doesn't really care about you. Yeah, uh, I've been trying to get employment for a while. I was there's been windows where I've gotten employment, but it's it's you know with Medicaid you can't make a certain amount of money or they take away your coverage and 
that's something that I think is, and our, our and our health our health expenses are astronomical, right? Uh, because we need so much. Uh, my chair just costs forty thousand dollars. That's that's just that's just overpriced bullshit. But anyway, thank you so much for taking my call. I've been trying to call for the past uh, past week, and I'm, I'm glad that you were able to take it. And thank you very much. Appreciate the call, sir. Taxing capital is always the way to go. Um, yeah, and, and, and I think we can also differentiate between what is actually like sort of, you know, valuable to society and not. Uh, but broadly speaking, the idea that you would you would tax work at a higher rate uh, than money is absurd. Psychotic. It's regressive. It's incredibly regressive. It, it's, it's absurd. It's a system that you would set up if you wanted to make sure that you kept all the money. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I think exactly there should be a 100 percent tax um, on capital. So. I guess the Bernie way is really the third way. It's the compromise, right, Mm -hmm. exactly. You're making a big compromise there with that. Um, Do you want to hear the Pelosi quote? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me hear the Pelosi quote. Okay. So she was talking on Meet the Press with uh, Chuck Todd. Oh, I'm sure this is a golden one. He uh, asked her to acknowledge the fact that middle class Americans and small businesses are really struggling with rising premiums under the ACA. And she said, quote, I wanted single payer. I mean, I'd love a single payer, but we're not there. I wanted a public option, which would address that. And this is like, besides, you know, the weird way that she phrased that, it's it's interesting to me that the, the, that the centrist Democrats keep pretending, right? I would love a single payer healthcare system, only uh, those pesky Republicans just won't let it through, or the voters won't vote for it, or we don't have the budget for it. And the function that people like Bernie and AOC serve is to make them admit why they're really against it and that they're against it in the first place. Yeah, I, look, I don't know if wh- where Pelosi is on that for reals. I don't, I don't know. But I think um, uh, the, she has an opportunity when she's on that Sunday show to make the case for single payer rather than saying uh, we didn't get it. Um, I mean, I don't think uh, Nancy Pelosi was certainly not responsible for the lack of a uh, public option, but the public option people, you know, should remember w- was a very, it was really just literally the toe that was supposed to keep the, the, uh, you know, stick it in the door. It was to provide a very small, um, uh, you know, proof of concept because Throughout the entire ACA in the uh, Obama uh, care marketplaces, we're talking only about 10 million people. And the public option, max, right? I mean, max in that situation, assuming there's one in every state, could only represent 10 million people, which is um, what? Less than a quarter of, of the people who are on Medicare. I mean, so we have a uh, we have this program that at least gives us a pretty good example of what uh, health insurance could look like. She should take that opportunity to sell um, uh, single payer in that moment. It, it's not inconceivable to me that she wouldn't be in favor really? of it. You think she would be in favor of expropriating like a substantial portion of the private sector because that's what single payer would do in terms of like uh, getting rid of. Well. I, first for off, profit insurance companies, which exist in direct opposition to working class people's life and health. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if when push came to shove, if she would be in favor of it. I mean, but, you know, she claims that she is good. I would like her to, you know, uh, it, you know, expound on that. Well, my uh, point is, it's going to be harder and harder for people like her to pretend if, in fact, they are not in favor of it because all of the other barriers are being removed, right? We have a high percentage of even Republicans are in favor of Medicare for all at this point in time. And we have the budget for it very demonstrably, right? Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, uh, that's that's the the idea. I you mean, also the problem look with at how much money Democrats are getting from the industry, which is a lot. Which, what's also and, and, and look. People shouldn't be, you know, uh, have any. A lot of these people are going to go and then be contracted to provide Medicare in, in a uh, Medicare for all system. There won't be, um, you know, you won't be, there won't be a profit margin. Uh, but well, in that's terms why of these employees, companies exist, though. Well, I understand, but the people who work there, they're, for them, it's not necessarily about a, uh, a profit, right? I mean, 
the the profit doesn't go in their pockets. Uh, the the profit goes in the the pockets of shareholders. Yeah, so, absolutely. So not. if you're an insurance adjuster and you're worried, well, if we go to a Medicare for all, I'm going to lose my job. That's probably not the case. <laughs> Um, what's probably going to happen is that you're going to end up, um, you know, may, being contracted for the government. The, uh, the, profit, the, the profitability of your company is going to go down, but that's not going to impact um, uh, those people. Well, Bernie's plan actually does have a plan to find new jobs for a lot of those people. Yeah. Because and- the people whose jobs are like basically denying people health care for whatever reason they can come up with. Those jobs shouldn't exist, right. and they won't exist. Right, right. Um, but but what's interesting is to see Nancy Pelosi's answer. Had you seen her on that program five years ago, the answer would have been, well, we should fix the Affordable Care Act. And what's interesting is that that's not the answer anymore. And a large, you know, a large part of that is the dynamic that you're talking about, where it's just like the more uh, people are introduced to the idea of of a single payer, the the more popular it gets, and then it's the harder it is for uh, politicians to um, to not support it. Uh, calling from a three two one area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Hi. Uh- Ethan from Tucson. Ethan from Tucson. What's on your mind? Um, this is, I mean, this was a while back, but I was curious if you guys um, saw that weird Ann Coulter tweet. About taxing wealth? Yeah. What I'm confused, So I don't know much about Ann Coulter because I think she was more around in Obama and maybe yeah. Bush. <laughs> yeah. But she also, I, love I thought, that. was very straightforwardly like i thought she was pretty early on with trump so i don't know how you know consistent her politics are so i couldn't tell if she was being sarcastic or if also it might be really easy to guess her password on twitter um so i no, i was curious I, if you i this is what i think that is i think there are some members of the conservative movement look it's a grift right ann coulter is just running a grift she's been running a grift for years And um, the way that she would get back into the news after a while of uh, of not being in the news would be to say something completely outrageous. Um, And um, and then people just stop taking her seriously. She just like it all passed her by in some respects. And I think there are some who are trying to figure out, like, where do I get positioned you know, to revive my career. I mean, you, you, look, it, it, honestly, the way to assess Ann Coulter is the same way that you would assess, like, um, I don't know, you know, some um, B or C list celebrity who's trying to get back into the news. Okay. And, okay, that makes sense. And, and so um, if they have to reinvent themselves again to do it, that's what they'll do. Um, and you know, I'm in that same business more or less. Um, I, I, it's just, it's just a question of like, you know, what, what am I willing to, to do, uh, to, you know, have people retweet me. Don't you think she's kind of doing a Tucker Carlson thing there? Exactly. Exactly. I think Tucker Carlson is also doing that. He is trying to position himself so that his show has, uh, some resonance because they're all, you know, realizing like, they're moving in the wrong direction and they're just trying to they're trying to rebrand. There is a precedent for this, though. It's like classic fascism, right? Like there have always been right wing critiques of capitalism. But the kind of the kind of capitalism that fascists like is like factories making things, not this like shadowy international finance capital, right, that they can blame on the Jews. So this there's a lot of historical precedents for this. Well, there's also like sort of white uh, like in the emergence of white identity in this country with regards to labor and, you know, basically like uh, the Democratic Party itself was like, we're white free men. We want to be respected economically. Basically, I think there is an awareness that um, the Democratic Socialist slash socialist message is appealing uh, to an increasing number of people who folks like Ann Coulter and um, and Tucker thought um, 
you know, we're we're more uh, in their column or potentially their audience. And so I think this is, you know, they're making an attempt to sort of, you know, get in on the ground floor of this. Well, that's where fascism comes from historically. I, like yeah. there were uh, left, there were communists and anarchists saying the the reason for the problems in your life is the ruling class at writ large. And then there were fascists on the right who said the reason for the problems in your life, uh, it's, it's not the ruling class. It's not capitalism. It's, you know, other groups of people and this specific poorly understood kind of capitalism that you don't like. And, and, and you know, look again, this is not terribly different than what Pat Buchanan was saying, uh, you know, uh, over you know in the early 90s and uh, through the 90s um there there's a strand in the conservative movement that that is that is like that um That's what Mussolini was saying it, yes he is, it was not american uh but yes colin uh thank you ethan i appreciate the call um uh, let's go through a couple i'm gonna take folks i'm sorry we're running out of time again uh, take one more phone call. Call from a 610 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Oh, hey, Sam. It's Mike from PA. How are you? Mike from PA. We had a very high Pennsylvania contingency getting on the phones today. Yeah. yeah. Sorry about that. I guess we have nothing to do. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> I wanted to, to discuss um, kind of the situation with Bernie and the whole sexual harassment uh issue have you looked into this at all i i i haven't spent too much time looking into it i mean um there were i think my understanding is that the claim is that there were people on the campaign who were uh sexual harassers um not necessarily at the tippity top of the campaign but in terms of like within the campaign and that uh that didn't reach um uh, you know, Bernie, um, uh, you know, that's what my understanding is, but I haven't, I haven't dug too deeply to be honest with you. Yeah. I, I just find it. I don't know. I don't, I'm trying to understand if he's going to announce or not. Um, and I know there are, you know, obviously people looking to uh, recruit him in, but you know, I'm not getting the same vibe that I thought I was going to get six months ago. I don't, the same way what, what I, i'm not sure i know what you I, mean by vibe i mean there as far uh, as him him running again um i you know i uh, well, over this weekend there are 400 house parties in 50 states um yes supposedly and i don't i think uh john from san antonio said that bernie is going to be um there's going to be a live stream conversation from key movement activists. There's no indication that um, uh, Bernie is going to address them. I don't actually do it. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, look, I, 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 I looked into my, that. My, my theory has been since Elizabeth Warren came out with that proposal about generic drugs that he was not going to run. Um, that that came shortly after a meeting with between the two of them and you know, to be honest with you, it's it's half baked. Who knows, right? I mean that that it, the, it, that theory on my part is half baked. Just that, like, it would be surprising that she would try and get, uh, uh, outflank him um, at this point. But maybe, uh, you know, uh, as opposed to, um, you know, being a candidate that wasn't uh, to the left of Bernie on some issues. Um, so I, I I don't know I. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if he's going to run or not, but I don't. Mm. Well, you know, it's, it's one of those things where I feel like Elizabeth Warren's announcement went a lot better than I expected it to. Um, and I think she has gone a long way of, of kind of like finding that lane that I didn't think existed um, between, you know, Bernie and more traditional Democratic you know, activists and people in that nature, you know, I was surprised Benjamin was so, so against her um, because nothing that he said really um, was concrete. Um, you know, like it's not her time or she missed her moment kind of, that sounds like gibberish to me. Uh, I don't know about you. Uh, 
I saw a study that just came out a couple days ago about support for Elizabeth Warren, and it said that there was also a test in the survey to measure le- levels of sexism. And I'm not trying to say that everybody who doesn't like Elizabeth Warren is sexist, but you know, of those people who tested higher than average, she had about a 20% approval rating in the Democratic Party. And those that had less sexism than, than average, she had an 85%. So I'm not saying 100% of the people who don't like Elizabeth Warren are sexist, but if you don't have a reason other than some very nebulous stuff about it not being her time, maybe you should re-examine exactly what, what's going on there. Well, I don't think um, he dislikes and- her. Yeah, I, I, my assumption was less that he wasn't saying that he wasn't supportive of her. He just doesn't think that it's going to... To that, that she's going to generate the same level of interest. I am, I, I, I am, sort of agnostic about the levels of interest that everybody can generate. I mean, that's sort of like I think it's a little bit early to make those assessments. Which I was saying uh, uh, last week is that, you know, you, the polling. You know, Ber- where did Bernie poll two years out from the election? Nowhere, right? I mean, just nowhere. I, I think. Frankly, Elizabeth Warren probably two years out was polling higher than Bernie uh, in the in twenty four. Oh, no, she of course she was polling very well, and she was the only progressive of any national profile. Right, and at I, that time, right, and I think like <laughs> yeah. we need to wait to to get a sense of of any of this stuff. We need to wait and see, um, you know, like what what happens when they start actually getting on the trail and start getting some national attention, but certainly. It seems to me, look, I think misogyny is real. And um, I think in some ways it is, um, it is a, it, it could very well be in this day and age a harder thing to escape than uh, racism in the context of a presidential election. Like the, well, well look, I think Obama never spoke about race. Right. To the point where he was getting criticized um, throughout the campaign and then obviously into his presidency by people who wanted him to um, to speak more about race. Uh, I think Clinton. I, 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 I disagree. I think he spoke about race but in a very conservative manner. Like there was a lot of you know, we've got to take care of our community, pull your pants well, up stuff. Right, right, <laughs> right, right, right. I, I, I don't think he's, yes. I mean, you could, uh, yeah, I, I, exactly. I mean, I think he basically spoke about race the way the conservatives wanted him to speak about race. Um, and yes. uh, which was all, you know, politics of respe- respect, re- respectability politics and personal responsibility and whatnot. I mean, okay, he, he spoke about race in that way. Um, I think it's harder for a uh, a woman to not be perceived like I just think that that our society has already sort of built in a um, you know and and I think racists and misogynists I, I don't think that they see I don't think that their uh, impetus to be misogynist or racist are as different as like we would perceive it on the receiving end. Right. Like, I think, you know, I've said this before that I think it's like they're just like, wait, that a woman president. That's that's another non-normal president. I'm not going for that twice. Um, but I well, do I mean, think, you know, black men got to vote 60 years. Before women did. Right. Uh, and, so, like, you know, the, the misogyny is very deep seated in gender roles, you know, that predates a lot of our racial politics. Gender oppression, of course, is is really deep and intractable in many ways. Yes. And I think like, I think, I think racists can say like, well, he's a black guy, uh, but he's not like the other black guys. Um, I think it's harder for, for them to say, well, she's a woman, but she's not like the other women. Like, I think that's, I think that doesn't happen as much. Uh, That dynamic is like, you know, I think like they like a black guy who they think proves that um, they're not racist. But I don't know that there's a, like, I don't think it works in the same way in terms of misogyny. Or, like, yeah, just look at who gets to be alt-right versus who gets to be alt-light, right? Like, the people who are hard-line uh-huh. white nationalists 
are completely marginalized from mainstream conservatism and the ones like the Proud Boys that are openly misogynistic and sexist but not openly white nationalist, they get to be alt-light, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, you know, it's tough because I look at a lot of these races that just happened, you know, and, and I look at Stacey Abrams and I think she did well and, you know, you know, Lucy McBath actually won that seat that John Ossoff lost. Uh-huh. Uh huh. You know, um, you know, we have another John Ossoff down in Texas who people have been talking about running for president, which I find really laughable, to be honest. But <laughs> maybe we'll see. I think like, you know, like Joe Biden and John and I'm um, sorry, Beto are really um, kind of paper tigers who are going to wilt the more attention they get from the media. And I do think that Bernie is going to, you know, if he decides to run, obviously getting back into the spotlight and uh, having his message, you know, mediated by a hostile media will do a lot of good for him. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, he, he didn't have anyone else like Elizabeth Warren running. Right. And, you know, honestly, I've worked with progressive candidates and, and activist groups, and I just like the Warren people a lot more. I just think they're more competent. And, that's that I think that's actually a big problem for Bernie is getting solid people to work on his campaign right now. Um, you, know, you need to have muscle in the sinew of a presidential campaign. It's not just the person at the top. It's the organization they put around him. And while a lot of people have examined Hillary Clinton's campaign and all the mistakes it made, fewer have really looked at Bernie and that's true. saw the mistakes he made. And he made a tremendous amount. Um, it sounds like I they had some real Warren. issues. Yeah. I, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Judging from the stories that, that have been coming out. Well, you know, in some respects, you know, uh, Warren, obviously building uh, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau is not uh, perfectly analogous, but it is... I mean, building a, a, a structure and designing it in such a way that it has been insulated. I mean, they're trying to destroy the, the, the Republicans want it's like like literally target number one. And in many respects, this thing is is going to come out the other side uh, of this and, and still exist. And, and that is a function of someone who knows how to design and operate and, and, and staff an institution. And there's some there, there you know. Uh, the the whole concept of 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 of, of personnel um, making policy is um, yeah I, I mean uh, I think that's super important and it's but you know I think that will bear out right over tough. time it'll bear out over time yeah I, you know like looking at like the organization going forward like she did that really as an activist you know she built her senate position purely from activism and fighting against what was basically a hostile democratic president yep. <laughs> and forcing him to bend because we all know what the Obama administration really was. Yeah. Um, and, and the fact that she ended up where, you know, that's what I, it attracts me to, to, to Bernie and Warren is they are activists first, politicians second. Yeah. They came to, to become politicians after being an activist. And Bernie attracts me more because, you know, I want on a bad socialist to run. That said, like, we need to have our best foot forward here. And I'm starting to get concerned with Bernie, which is something I never thought I would say, just based on this, you know, this sexual harassment stuff is really scary to me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is the kind of um, stuff that I don't want to do see Do you think sexual harassment happening. doesn't happen in every workplace in the world though i don't think the issue of, it, of it of it of it happening is the issue the issue is that it is something that was not addressed and not uh, there was not a structure in place uh that allowed for it to be handled in real time right is that what you're talking about a lot about? of workplaces have that issue though well Hillary, yeah but the well, Hillary yeah, campaign no, did and, too and also, yeah the Hillary campaign did too like which i mean in in oh god Hillary. God. But that's but that but that is the Can point. That is the point. The and Bernie was dismissive terrible. on TV about it recently too. Well, yeah, but it's it's it it goes. Well, I think what Mike is saying is that it's about 
the competency level of the organization where this type of stuff, obviously, and I, I don't think there's any argument that um, that the the Hillary campaign was, uh, you know, had a tremendous competency issue uh, that 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 manifests itself in, in, in a myriad of ways. Um, and I think um, if you can't police this basic thing, particularly right, like we're not talking about there are companies that all, all, all have this problem. I'm not surprised, frankly, that in a corporate setting. Uh, maybe this, these issues aren't uh, addressed the way they should be. But you have a campaign that is literally um, when, when, you know, where there should not be any ideological uh, impediments, impediments to, to dealing with it, then it becomes a competency issue as opposed to a will issue. And if right. the will cannot be uh, executed, when there's clearly a will there, obviously, nobody in either one of those campaigns, I think, um, is, you know, sort of thinks it's not a problem. Um, then right. then that's that's what that's what, you, you know, we're talking about in terms of a concern. With that said, you know, I think he's he launched a messaging campaign last time, uh, did not necessarily uh, think well, did not think that he could win, did not think that that's what he was running for when he entered in there and you choose yep. different personnel. And, you know, I think uh, certainly, you know, since then he has staffed at least at the top, you know, in a very different way is my understanding. So, you know, maybe they learned their lesson. Yeah. Maybe they hired some better people this time around. I don't know. Well, they're not, I, they're not having Jeff Weaver be the campaign manager right. this time. I still think well, that yeah, the candidate you know, is incredibly important very... as well, ahead, because, uh, I understand how stupid politics are in this country and how most people do not vote on ideology or issues. They vote based on, you know, what culture they belong to, oh, what kind of family they grew up in and the vibe of the candidate, the general vibe. So when I say that Elizabeth Warren doesn't have the right vibe or demeanor to go up against Trump and win, that's not because I don't like her. I like her just fine. She's my second choice after Bernie. It's because I, I understand how dumb politics are. And also, he can't transfer all of that energy magically to her. That's not how it works. If Warren was really popular in Massachusetts, I'd feel a lot more comfortable about her. I mean, I hope she runs. I, I like her running for a lot of the same reasons you've said. And I know people who've worked on like in finance and have told me about how she's spoken of by people on like Wall Street. And so that means like I'm good with Elizabeth Warren. But... I wish she was more popular there. And I do think she is her, her continued tone deafness about the, the ancestry stuff. Like it might not be hugely deciding, but it, it does work. That worry actually does worry me. Can I say one thing about her Massachusetts, uh, the vote she got, because I feel like this is a talking point that I need to debunk. She was running with a democratic nominee for governor who was the weakest democratic gov nominee in the entire country. Um, Baker, who was a Republican, got 66% of the vote. So when she won by more than 20 points, um, it was in the context where the top of the ticket could not have been worse. So, like, for me, I, I don't think that there's actually anything there there about her in Massachusetts, you know, not being, you know, popular enough. I think that's kind of nonsense. Like, <laughs> you know, you have to find people in like circumstances and there's nobody, the only person who you can actually point to and say, wow, they really outperformed their state would be Sherrod Brown. Right. Like everyone else is pretty much in the same band of a point or two um, of expectation. And she's actually slightly above, you know, expectation, not even taking into consideration the weakness of, of Baker's opponent. I can't even remember his name. Uh, Fair enough. And I also so, just I think that know. Massachusetts I, I, is a weird state in some respects. I mean, and I say this as someone who who obviously who grew up there, uh, but it, it, Massachusetts has a weird uh, relationship, uh, I think, like with um, with 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 women and people of color. I, I really just it's just I don't know really even how to put my my finger on it. It's just weird. Uh, there's a lot, there's a strong sense of like, of, of civic responsibility to not be racist and misogynist, 
but there is a <laughs> strong I, I this is my take on it like but there's a strong sort of like personal like private uh, sense of misogyny and racism and I think sometimes that tension plays out in very weird ways um, like you know like 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 a it's almost like a resent in a way. I mean, that's what I pick up with when I go back home. That's what I pick up from like for, with with Elizabeth Warren. It's like, ugh, damn it, <laughs> like well, I had to vote for her. And you know, it was that type <laughs> of like the, some sense like that. Uh, but all right, well, listen, Mike, I uh, appreciate the call, but we got to get going, buddy. Uh, all right, all we'll right, bud. have a good one. Enjoy would, your weekend. I look forward right. to talking about this all the time, forever until twenty twenty. Well. It is what it is. Folks, I'm sorry we are out of time. Uh, I know people have been on hold for uh, 90 minutes plus in some instances. We have uh, almost 20 people on hold now, uh, but uh, we just have run out of time. Um, we will see you on Sunday. Uh, let me uh, go through. we got a bunch of uh, IMs. So we'll do some IMs, and then we'll get out of here. Um So in response to uh, Mike from PA, what guarantee is that the Elizabeth Warren's campaign won't also have sexual harassment issues? It's kind of bizarre just to assume that she couldn't also have those same issues. No, I think um, it's it's conceivable that she could. I think every campaign on some level is going to. It's just a question of is the campaign structured enough uh, and organized enough uh, so that problems are addressed quickly and timely? And I think from Mike's experience, it's a limited anecdotal experience. He has found the uh, a core competence amongst the Warren people that he didn't find amongst the Bernie people. And he is a, I think, um, obviously, uh, he prefers Bernie as a candidate. So he's just making uh, an, an assessment based upon his own experience working in that field. That's all. Uh, Hogan and Lee. This week, Marco Rubio faced with the result of the GOP dumbing down its base for 20, 30 years. Matt Gates, ladies and gentlemen, both warned Trump against using national emergency based on the precedent it would set. Rubio argued that a Democratic president could use an emergency to address climate change. Gates, being keen to real dangers such as a president, warned that a Dem president could declare an emergency and have transgender <laughs> bathrooms installed in every school across the country. He's all about the zeitgeist. Is that really right? Did Matt he do that? Gates, yeah. I mean, what he's an trolling. idiot. Jay Tingle. Uh, aren't all comedians self-styled? Uh, Jimmy Carter was a nuclear engineer assisting in the design and development of nuclear propulsion plants for naval vessels. Interesting. Wisconsinite, the left must champion open source software like VLC, which Matthew Film Guy praised. Consider donating to open source. Uh, Majority Report uses Audacity, uh, VLC, and a few other open source Boom. programs. Boom. Uh, illegal Senior, Fire Michael. He has his own damn show. Why continue to let him sully yours? Uh, Christo, Happy New Year, MR Friends. Upon the recommendation of Matthew Film Guy, I recently watched Film Worker, the documentary account of longtime dedicated right hand man to Sid Stanley Kubrick, Leon Vitali. Film Worker also led me to rewatch Barry Lyndon, where Vitali was one of the principal actors in Clockwork Orange, quite a double feature to be sure. P.S. It was Isabel Gillies who recommended Force Majeure. Ah, looking forward to seeing all of you at the Bell House, indeed. Uh, Ralph Spoil Sport. I worked on both Scarecrow and Friends of Eddie Coyle. Wow, sound. Both are excellent, as are Pacino, Hackman, and Mitchum. Left is best. Isabella Gillies uh, recommended Force Majeure. Oh, there you go. GG. You guys are funny. This Tulsi smearing, and you won't play my response song. Uh, although Brooks should hear it. LOL. Who's GG? I'm going to guess this is Jimmy Reefer Cake. Oh. Did he have a song this week? I don't know. I neglected to check. All right. Well, I'm sorry. We will play it uh, next week uh, when here's there. Uh, Sam, I need a poster. Please, how else can I get one? We'll see. If there's any left over, we will uh, perhaps uh, sell them. There's a merch shop coming, too. Oh, and there's a merch shop coming, folks. Gregory from Oklahoma, have you seen the movie Vice? Yes, I have. We've talked about it a little bit. It's written by Adam McKay. Thought it was great. Go watch it. Also, Sam, when was the first presidential election you got to vote in? It was in 1980 for my parents and 2016 for me. My first one was 88. I missed 84 by three weeks. I was so bummed. Wait a second. No, I missed 80 by three weeks. No, 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 no. No. 
And no, I'm not that old. 84. I missed being 18 by three weeks. God damn it. I wanted to vote against Reagan, and I, and I didn't have the opportunity to. You want to feel like you are old. Ask Brendan the first election he voted in. I don't want to know. I read, I, re I read Mondale's, I was so excited to vote against Reagan, I read Mondale's biography. Um, Did you just say you couldn't vote in 08? Wow. Oof, now I feel Jesus. old. A squared, oh my God, it's a long time Cedarista. I better get one of those posters. Maybe we'll have some stuff that is available only to members. A members like a members merch. Yeah, they get first, first priority. Yeah. That's a good idea. Matt Youth felt like it was important to tell the MR crew that my wife was sitting next to none other than the ambassador, Scott Br Scotty B, oh, at a spin class this morning. Hope this will lead to five minutes of Scotty B impression of Sam and Michael. God damn. Did he hit on here? her? Huh? Did Scotty B hit on her? Oh, dude. He's, uh, every time he's on a spin class, he's hitting because he's just he's pushing it to the, to the limit. Psychedelic Quaker. Every POTUS after Eisenhower was in the Navy up until George W. Uh, GW2, huh? Well, the list I said didn't include Bill Clinton on that. Reagan was in the Army and Air Force. FDR was not nothing. Chris Lapaco, I did a DNA test, and I found out I'm almost 20% Ashkenazi Jew. Also, I'm not the father. Can I get 20% of a shofar? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Trump's umbrella, still on the tarmac. Crowder is a bitch, left his best. <laughs> Louis 77 sorry missed most of today's show caught the part where Matthew film guy recommended the intruder if there was ever a Conan a Corman film that deserved Thai criterion restoration treatment that'd be the one if you don't count little shop of Haros or Vincent Price E.E. E. Poe adaptations that is Ryan in LA Carter went to Annapolis and was an officer during on the first nuclear submarine Nixon served in the Navy and won enough at poker to fund his political campaign and <laughs> I don't think that's where he got all the funds for that campaign. Left. Show enough. Left, uh, left is show enough. Uh, when I say who's the master, you say AOC, AOC, then we say show enough. Okay, folks, see you to Monday. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want. But I know somehow I'm gonna get there I wasn't looking when I just got caught Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better Yeah, I know the clock is ticking But the meds are gonna kick in